All right, well, uh, let's call this meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I think we had one uh, addendum to give. Right, I just wanted to add that yeah. we had a very short discussion about our summer schedule. Great, any other changes? Great. So uh, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so general business and appearances. So this is time for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would uh, keep your comments relatively brief, that would be helpful. Um, so if you come, to, uh, say your name and uh, where do you go? Back again, Maurice Martino, 6 Scribner Street. We'll see you up on Scribner Street next month on that affair. Um, Two things I just wanted to ask if there was any more conversation about the crosswalk on River Street. And then the second thing I wanted to let people know that I have contacted Colin O'Neill over at the Wrightsville Reservoir where they have the disc golf course. We've nailed down a date where we're going to have a tournament there in the third week of October. I've contacted hotels to find out if that's a slow weekend for them so that we can fill those. I've contacted a marketing company in Montreal, and I've contacted a marketing company in Boston. Our goal is to have this start out here, and Montpelier Alive is on board, and I've got a meeting with them next week. If you don't know already, Vermont has the highest ratio of disc golf courses in the nation. If we want young people to come here and see this nation, uh, this nation, this country, this state, we've got to get young people here. Colin is also building one in Norwich University, and he's got two more, one for Barry City and one for Barry Town. 31 years of marketing and sales. I picture in five years that we have a four-day tournament similar to a professional, but we don't want professionals here. They don't spend money. You've got to pay them to come. We want young people, and we want novices, and it's best held in the fall after the leaves are down so that they can see the course. And then I'm also going to be talking to the local bars and breweries because I picture having a different brewery sponsor each hole and see if we can have them a tasting site. And then we expect to have fans. I have a five-year goal that we're going to be bringing about 30,000 people into this city for this in five years. And I hope they're all under the age of 30. So, but just over to 21. Like, but over 21 for that. Picky, picky. <laughs> <laughs> but then the other thing is I want food trucks there and eventually camping. And maybe we can have it in all four of those locations and Central Vermont will be known as a drawing card for young people. And suddenly they see, wow, wouldn't it be great to be able to live here? Maybe it'd be great to invest here so I have a reason to come back every year for this. I'm passionate about this. We need to get young people here. And both my sons are 28, and they're down flatlanders, and they said they'd be the first ones to sign up. And they'll bring both bring a foursome, so I've already got eight people coming. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, just on your first point about the question about the uh, crosswalk, so just so you know how I'm thinking about that, there have been a number of requests that we've gotten uh, for speed bumps in different places um, uh, and other crosswalks in um, other places even other than that. And so uh, one of the things that the um, Multiple Transportation Infrastructure Committee is taking on right now is if we want to add uh, traffic, traffic calming or um, th those kinds of um, changes, uh, what's the process to go through? And so um, my hope is that we can get a process from them in the, the near future and then run all these kinds of requests through that process and so we haven't forgotten there's there just may be um there may be a process to it and then the the second thing about um the disc golf tournament as a fellow lover of disc sports i'm very psyched <laughs> to participate in your in your okay, the next four so and i did speak to our manager about the pilot program so i was really pleased to get that information from him Thank you. And, and we did look at, uh, we did refer your specific request to the people. 
Sorry, I'm following up to see what's happening. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, moving on to the consent agenda. We have a motion. So moved. Second. And no one wants to pull anything? Awesome. Um, uh, okay, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Moving right along. The tax increment financing uh, public hearing. So I guess we should. Open the hearing. Yeah, we're going to open the hearing. Um, <coughs> I guess we'll start with. Uh, Stephanie, if you have any things you want to add or kick us off here with, um, and then afterwards, <laughs> if there are other further comments from the public, then we can sure. that. As someone once said, um, sorry, I didn't have time to write a short letter. I wrote a long one instead, I think. But lucky for you, I have made this presentation very concise at the urging of your management. So. Uh, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, you know me, Stephanie Hanley with White & Burke Real Estate Investment Advisors. We've been counseling the city since last July on the viability of a tax increment financing district and then preparing the application that will go to the state. Just a quick refresher because it never hurts to hear what TIF is one more time and also because the public is listening and this is a public hearing for um, the purposes of education, continual education. And tax increment financing is a funding mechanism intended to catalyze private sector development. And to do that, it is the city's investment into the public infrastructure that is acting as a barrier to that private development. And the way that the city pays for the infrastructure is not through the uh, use of taxes on the, uh, on the base, but rather using the new taxes um, that are generated by the new development projects that come about as a result of you taking away the barriers. So it is this cyclical cycle that happens with a uh, cyclical cycle. <laughs> All right. All right. We're starting strong. Um, it is a nice cyclical tool that ends up uh, using a portion of the state education fund taxes that uh, would not have otherwise occurred if, you, if the city did not make the investments into the infrastructure. So but for the city making the investments uh, that the public can use and that will catalyze the private development, these things would not otherwise occur. With that in mind, what we did uh, as a team was to work with city management, some of the city council, local stakeholders, property owners, and Montpelier Development Corporation and Montpelier Live to pull together a list of all of the infrastructure barriers that were really posing a problem for private developers who wanted to make their projects happen but have been stalled for years. We all know that the cost of development in downtowns is really high and the additional infrastructure barriers based on aging infrastructure or problems that have pre-existed maybe even that property owner's ownership uh, it can add to that cost and make it un unfeasible. It does not pencil out. So as we worked together as a group we came up with this boundary for the TIF district in the orange that is our proposed TIF district. It connects the east and the west sides of the downtown core to incorporate the housing parcels out at Sabins Pasture and Vermont College of Fine Arts and also the downtown core. The green line that you can see there is the designated downtown, so the TIF district is almost entirely within that. And the purple line is actually collinear on the northeast corner there. Uh, hard to see, but that purple line is the growth center boundary, and we are entirely within the growth center, which was an important distinction when we were trying to bring this application to the state. And as you know, the process is to get this approved and bring this through the, the city council, but also then need, it needs state approval from the Vermont Economic Progress Council from VEPSI. So this is our district, and within that district, we have identified eight different infrastructure projects that would catalyze nine, I think we have nine technically within different phases, private development projects. So starting from the east and moving west, there are two housing projects that have long been talked about along Berry Street at the Vermont College of Fine Arts and Sabin's Pasture. They 
are in desperate need of the infrastructure along the Barry Street corridor, both the utility work and road transportation improvements, including the roundabout or the intersection, I should say, of Barry Street and Main Street. The granite sheds, which are number four on this list, are on this map, are along Barry Street, underdeveloped, underutilized parcels that could be redeveloped into commercial and or housing projects, but they also have brownfield issues. So with some assistance from the state, assistance through TIF, those could be mitigated and those parcels could be developed into more robust and higher value parcel, private development parcels. Moving downtown, there's the pit, which would then, if, if there was infrastructure assistance with the sewer and water lines there, as well as the intersection uh, traffic signal, the Vermont Mutual site might get redeveloped, and the state and Governor Davis lot would also could also see some more further development if there was improvements to the infrastructure. And then finally, at the core of the downtown is the Capitol Plaza project. The Capitol Plaza project is has been worked on concurrently alongside this TIF district development since the TIF was reauthorized by the state. And that project has been developed with a partnership in mind with the city to help with the parking problem, the parking shortage and the cost of structured parking being quite a burden on, on the cost of the project. There's also Christchurch housing at this site that also needs affordable housing and needs parking. And there are other uses in the area that public parking would help to incentivize other development. So a parking garage that would serve lots of uses downtown is one of the possible options. Again, I use the word possible and could because this is simply a menu of options. It doesn't commit the city to anything at this stage, but gives, them the, gives you the option to use this if the tool is approved. Bullet point numbers. We are projecting if everything was done in this district, which we don't expect would happen over the course of 10 years, a lot of things can change and evolve, but if it did happen, $7.8 million of infrastructure investment just using TIF, but that also leverages additional funds through state match and federal match with some of the projects. Through that invest infrastructure investment, we could see a $66.5 million increase of the grand list in incremental new property value over the course of um, the next 10 years. That's the investment period that you have to, to do the infrastructure. And then the incremental taxes gained over the next 20 years will be used to pay down the debt service for that $7.8 million infrastructure. That's the high points. You have all the materials in front of you within this TIF district plan. We have to put together the TIF district plan because it is a comprehensive document that really explains more than I was able to do in the last five minutes, but puts together all of the background data for how we came to these assumptions. They really are assumptions in our model that it's not perfect and we know that those are likely to change. As these projects become more granular and crystallized, the City Council will have in front of them a development agreement before any project goes forward where you would look at the numbers in more detail. But we've put together those projections. We've also then packaged this up um, into the TIF district plan for you to approve. All of that gets wrapped in another blanket that gets sent to the state for the application. That application includes more data so that the state can get more familiar with your specific community. Why do you need this? I should mention that the TIF district, that TIF districts exist a lot across the state. They are authorized to be used in St. Albans, Barrie, Burlington, Hartford, Bennington. So Montpelier is not unique in using this tool, but there are a limited number of spots authorized, authorized by the state for this particular use of this tool. And this would be used in conjunction with lots of other tools to make these private infrastructure, pro private development projects catalyzed through public infrastructure. We plan on applying to the state within the next week, in which case pending decision on this TIF district plan tonight, and hopefully be heard by the Vermont Economic Progress Council board this summer so that if the City Council chose to go forward with a bond vote, you'd be prepared to do so with TIF in your pocket for the November vote. That was what we were working toward. We're on track for that timing. Um, but it, again, right now, this is just an authorization of the tool. How, how long? Seven minutes, something? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. Any questions?
Yeah. So I just want to, I've received a lot of questions about this and I had an opportunity to ask my questions, but I'm just going to ask them so everyone who's here and everyone who's watching can hear. So just, just to be clear though, so if we approve TIF right now, we are not wed to any of these potential projects. So we're not wedded to a parking garage or the housing projects that are proposed in there at all. Those are all separate things that would need to come before the city council for approval. Absolutely. Okay. You guys have always asked lots of good questions along the way, so this is this is good. This is good. <laughs> and you improved the maps. I, really I, right? I, I got the mapping, the mapping line, thanks to Glenn. Yeah, this is good. And I've documented all this process in our package to the state, so they know, and they've got video uh, and minutes, and they get to see that the the municipality has been brought along throughout this entire process, but knowing that you get to have further conversations at further meetings. Further questions? So I will just say that the, the piece we need tonight is a resolution that there is statutory requirement for specific action to be taken, which is why the, the resolution is so specifically worded. Um, we are also asking that the, uh, get a little bit technical here, the original taxable value, that is the existing tax base within that district that you saw, that le those lines, every parcel has been identified in a table called Table 5H. That gets certified today by the mayor and by the assessor to say, this is our baseline. Now going forward, everything is built off of that baseline. So between that and the resolution, that's all we need tonight. So this is also time for the public to ask questions. Um, so if you would like to, please come up. We have no idea at this point that this vote just authorizes a TIF district tool to potentially be used. Um, if if there were a public private bond vote, obviously we would know the numbers and release them. But at this point, we're not even close to guessing. So we don't know that there's going to be a bond. The the, the goal was in order, if the city chooses to work with Capitol Plaza Buildings parking garage, which we publicly owned, it would have to be if we use TIF. They want to get started by fall, so we would need to be on board with that. We have to construct so that if one of the reasons for the timing of this application was to allow that opportunity if we chose to do it, but there's been no commitments yet to do that. When do you think you might have those numbers? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, obviously, I'm not trying to play coy. I, I mean, obviously, well in advance of a warrant bond vote, and they would be vetted publicly and discussed here. We just, we're not there yet with discussions with the, the, the plus. Sam Corkin, on Cherry Avenue. Um, I have a couple of questions. One was there was an early slide that had a couple of different numbers on it, but they seemed very different to each other. It looked like it was talking about bonding for about $8 million for the infrastructure. And then it talked about an increase of $66 million in new property value. But that's not value to the city. That's value to individual owners that couldn't be taxed on. But my question is, if the city bonds for millions of dollars, the comment I believe was that the incremental change, increased taxes on the new development or increased value would then make the bond payments. But wouldn't that be extremely backloaded because you can't tax it until it's making money, it's already been built. So how are the bond payments made for the first eight or ten years or whatever the process is? Sure, sure. it's a great question. Um, there's a, t a table that has this kind of mapped out really specifically, but it has to do with cash flow. So you're right, that the cash flow of that $66 million, that property value doesn't all hit in those first few years. So there are first few years, but ultimately the tax Taxes paid on the 66.5 over 20 years pays off the debt service of the 7.8 million initially. There will be initial years of cash flow where there's not, you don't have a perfect match, but over time, that's the whole point of a district, is that the money continues to go into the pot over the course of 20 years to pay down that debt service. You would explain before that how you backloaded in your initial money so you can make the payments, which I think is right. Sam's point. Right. Can you explain that to him because I can't localize it. Yeah. So there's twenty, you know, twenty to thirty years of bond serve, of, of bond debt service payments based on that that investment. 
and you start retaining cash flow, it depends on what, what bond you use, a 20 year or a 30 year, and you start using that retained incremental tax revenue to pay down those debt service payments every year. But those debt service payments aren't 7.8 million every year, they're you know, maybe 300,000 a year at certain times, depending on what you've bonded for. So I don't know if you're getting at the initial gap. Is that your your main question, or is it just yeah. about gross? Because in gross... No, the, the initial gap is how the debt is serviced before any of this... So the city would have to do cash flow management. I think that's the short answer. We oh. either borrow from one of our yeah. funds and we do it in a fund oh, yeah, transfer. The is the tip a thing that makes that different than any other bond that will because now you get to retain also a portion of the state incremental taxes. That's the, the, I think that's the key factor is that anything financed through TIF of that new revenue, 70% of the school tax also goes into the TIF fund, which wouldn't happen for normal grandless growth. And, and my second question was about the certification from the lister and from the mayor as to the section of the grant list within the borders. Is the assumption that any increase in the list value of those properties would be due to the tip as opposed to what happened anyway? And how is the growth in those that happened anyway separated from growth that is believed to be tip related? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, so it isn't separated. Um, if anything new from this point forward goes into the TIF fund, and the point, the reason for that is the assumption that a lot of this catalyzed. This is a lot of infrastructure catalyzing a lot of different development. Maybe there's stuff that would have happened otherwise. There is that statement that you know somebody was already planning on redeveloping their property in a year. But as you do this as a district, you do that in order to make sure you have enough money to pay your debt service over the course of the 20 years. And ultimately, all of that money, if there's a surplus, goes back to where it was the, both the general fund and the state. But that's used to pay down that debt service just within that portion, too. It's not the whole city. You know, it's a very small portion of the whole city. What percentage of the value of the grant list is within the borders? I have that somewhere. <laughs> um, it's really small. It's um, in terms of, do you mean in terms of grant list or in terms of uh, acreage? Grant list, right. Hold on. I can find that number. The original, it would be the original taxable baseline value. Is that right? So it would be $9,276,900. Does that sound right? Sounds about right. It's on, <laughs> I can't, about the, the PDF is not saturated. About 10%. Probably 10 or 11%. Yeah, Thanks. that sounds about right. In terms of value. Thank you. Acreage wise, it's tiny. So if. 70% of the taxes that would be paid on that new development goes to the city to pay off its debt. How does the state make up that 70% of the money that would normally be in the education fund? Do they have to raise the property tax on everybody or however they're doing taxes now? What you're getting at is is a great question that that is the neck is the the heart of TIF, which is that these would not otherwise happen if it weren't for this investment. So the the state education fund is not giving anything up because it wasn't going to happen anyway. That's the that or wouldn't happen to as desirable a manner. But maybe Anne can I, add to I that. would add yeah. that um, all the taxes that the state is collecting um, right now, they will continue to collect um, because this is the, the portion that we are um, using to pay down debt service for public infrastructure is just the improvement on the property. So they're not getting, getting any less money. Arguably, they are going to get more money just over time. So they're getting 30%. In the meantime. Of yes. the new. In the meantime, yes, of the new. So it's, so it's basically the, 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 the rate would be paid at the same value as it is right now. And then anything above that, we would retain the 70% and the state would get the remaining 30%. It's not so. losing anything that they're currently getting. They're getting 30% okay. of the new revenue. Okay. So the assumption is that taking this parking garage as an example, that would not go forward without TIF financing. Okay. Great question. Any other questions? And we will put these on the website as well. These are good FAQs, so they'll be on the website. 
All right, I guess with that, then we will close the public hearing. And uh, so at the end of the attachment uh, to this uh, item, um, there is a resolution that I believe uh, we need to pass. Is there a motion about that? The, very, the agenda very format is very blurry. I it's believe it's sheet. page 52 and 53. If you go to it from the agenda, it's the very last few pages, but it, the spacing is kind of strange on everything, so it's hard to... Oh. It, it is the last two pages of the attachment online. It's below the it's Oh, if you, if you go to the agenda and click on the, this item, it says download. I again. Click yes. There. Maybe somebody else. Oh, tricky. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry that it's sorry that it's tricky. Got it. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Do we have to read it out? Can we just pass the resolution? I think you can pass the resolution. I don't know your rules. Pass it if you yeah. Want to read it, you can. I think so. It's fine. Here, I'll do Perhaps, perhaps we should just because. Um, dotting eyes. In case people hadn't had a chance to see it. Um, do you mind? Okay. Well, at the top it says resolution tax increment financing district. Whereas tax increment financing is a critical tool for the city to have in its economic toolbox to provide revenues beyond normal municipal revenue sources for those infrastructure improvements that serve the proposed TIF district and are essential to enable and stimulate development or redevelopment within the district provide for employment opportunities, improve and broaden the tax base, and enhance the general economic vitality of the municipality, the region, and the state. See 24 VSA 1893. And whereas for the city of Montpelier to remain a healthy and economically vibrant regional center, it must continue to make substantial public investments that encourage private investment and development in the Montpelier community. And whereas a tax increment financing district will provide the city with the supplemental funds necessary to make public investments that enable beneficial plan development and redevelopment, provide for employment opportunities, improve and broaden the tax base, and enhance the general economy of the city. And whereas the city of Montpelier is responsible for developing and maintaining all public infrastructure and facilities necessary for the continued success and development of its downtown area, and whereas Montpelier will be economically strengthened through continued improvements to public infrastructure and facilities and private investment in property development and redevelopment, and whereas new real property development and redevelopment would not likely occur or would occur in a significantly different and less desirable manner without the use of tax increment financing. And now, therefore, be it resolved that pursuant to 24 VSA I section. section 1892A, the City of Montpelier City Council hereby finds expressly that the creation of the City of Montpelier TIF District, as shown on the map attached hereto as Exhibit A, in which proposed public improvements as described in the City of Montpelier TIF District Plan represent improvements which could not occur without the availability of TIF district financing as a tool, and but for the availability of TIF district financing, the city would not be able to make these improvements that serve the district and related costs, which, in keeping with the purpose of tax increment financing as described at 24 VSA section 1893, will stimulate development or redevelopment within the district, provide for employment opportunities, improve and broaden the tax base, and or enhance the general economic vitality of the municipality, the region, and the state and be it further resolved that the City Council establishes the City of Montpelier Tax Increment Financing District with boundaries as shown on the map attached hereto as Exhibit A, which map shall be recorded with the Office of the City Assessor along with this resolution, and be it further resolved that the City Council pursuant to 24 VSA 1892 hereby approves and adopts the City of Montpelier TIF District Plan concurrent with the TIF District Financing Plan attached hereto as Exhibit B which plan shall be recorded with the Office of the City Assessor along with this resolution. And be it further resolved that the City Council authorizes the City Manager or his designee to submit the full application for the City of Montpelier Tax Increment Financing District to the State of Vermont Economic Progress Council with this resolution representing the City's positive vote to establish the City of Montpelier TIF District 
as delineated on Exhibit A and its pledge to reserve 100 percent of the incremental city property tax revenues received from properties within the Montpelier TIF district towards the re retirement of the TIF debt incurred and be it further resolved that the City Council pledges that a minimum of 100 percent of the incremental city property tax revenues received from properties within the City of Montpelier TIF district shall during the legal life of the district be allotted allocated solely towards the retirement of the debt incurred pursuant to the approved TIF district plan stated today in Mark Well done. I would I know. I I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank I you for indulging me. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I would move that we adopt the resolution that Glenn just read for all of us. Wouldn't that be 70%, not 100%? That's it. Did you look at that? You said 100% a couple of times. No, so the, um, the I can explain. Yeah. Second. Oh, did you made a motion. I made a motion. Is there a second? Yes. Jack is seconded. Further discussion, and we have a question about whether it's 100%. I can answer that. 70% um, of the school revenues, the city can pledge up to up to 100% of, of the new city revenues. So, so that's what we're doing here. And that's so. cited specifically. Any anytime it says 100%, it's of the incremental city property tax. Um, yeah, sure. Right? Or no, did we close the public hearing? Well, you can. I would reopen it and certainly answer the question. Sure, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's the same concept that we were talking about. Let's make sure people understand. Is the statutory requirement 100% or is it authorized up to 100% of the incremental property tax increase? And if it's not a statutory requirement, how does the city arrive at deciding to use 100% as the amount? As I understand, it's between 70 and 100. 85%. 85 and 100 of the city. Um, when we ran all our numbers for all of these projects, none of them worked unless we put 100% in. So that was how. I, based on that additional information, my concern is that tied to my initial question about locking in the baseline at this minute and, guarantee, and committing 100% of the increase in, prop, in incremental property taxes to retiring a bond with this taking money that, unless you assume that there would be zero growth whatsoever in property taxes, you are guaranteeing money that otherwise wouldn't exist to repay a bond. It's, that's a, that is a correct assumption that th that's what this tool does. That's right. That's one of the trade-offs that you make to be able to use it. And I, I would assume, though, that the count that we would get that information about what the debt repayment structure would look like well before we made any decision about approving any particular project. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, yes. Stephen Whitaker, I I was unable to view that. I, I, I thought that the resolution contained a whole lot of uh, speculative and uh, potentially unsubstantiated uh, conclusions that y'all are about to vote on. And I'm concerned that that wasn't read before the public hearing and or I find the, web, the new website hosted somewhere else to be very uh, unconsumer friendly. Uh, but unless you absolutely must vote on this tonight, I think that circulating that resolution uh, widely for comment. I mean, I'm not sure if it's just a pro forma thing or not, but I heard a lot of stuff in that resolution that uh, I could take issue with, but I'm not prepared more do I think it effective to try to do so tonight. Uh, so just to respond, um, as far as I read, I mean, these are things that we, I feel, I feel comfortable voting on this because um, these are things that we've been talking about for months now um, and there was there were no surprises in there for me anyway <laughs> so I, I feel good about it um, but I'll just leave that there uh, any further comments okay um, no further discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed okay great um, Central Vermont Thank you, Stephanie. Thank, Thank you, guys. I'm excited to uh, move forward with these projects. Just want to make sure we get the resolution signed. Um, hey, Stephanie, can you sign something? Okay. <laughs> yes. He's taking them remotely. John is taking them remotely, and I'm also taking them. <laughs> Thank you.
Nope. It's covered. Hey, Kim. How are you doing today? Hi, Ann. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you, Tom. So, thank you for being here. So, the CBPSA. And just to uh, uh, say a little bit about this before we get started, I um, just want to recognize that the last time you. The last time you were here, um, I think we gave you all some directive to have a proposal uh, by November of this year. And so this is just intended to be an update, particularly because we have new council members. Just want to get everybody up to speed. Okay, well, thank you for having us. Um, I'll give this clicker. Bill wants it off. So, so you have a presentation? We don't have a presentation. Okay, so um, I... No, you don't need to move. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for... Uh, having us tonight you know there's a lot that has happened since the last time we we're here obviously there's a bunch of new faces since we were here in January um, you know I brought some information I don't know if Paco's handed out but I think he will what I plan on really going I'll start the conversation and talk about some of the general overview of what we've done since the January vote here at this body and then give you fill you in in regards to what uh, what we've done since then. Um, if you have any questions, particularly the newer council members, if you want to know anything about history before that, we got about seven years other history. We have hundreds of pages of either reports or projects or whatever we've worked on through the years that's gotten us to this point. And I'd be happy to sit down with anyone and answer any questions leading, leading us up to this proposal and the vote that occurred in March. So um, if I can interrupt you, if sure. you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. Okay. Certainly. Tom Galanka, uh, Chair of the Central Mount Public Safety Authority. Uh, my last city role that I've been on for a number of years. And so um, Paco Almont, he's our Executive Director, has been helping lead this effort with our board. Donna's the other um, rep who's the current board member with the Montpelier. Uh, Kim Cheney, who's an at-large board member um, that's voted between the member towns. Um, Sam Dorkin, he's another board member in the back, and he's another at-large board member voted collectively from the, the, the member towns, which currently are Barry City and Montpelier. Um, as many of you recall, we were here in January, January 10th to be exact, and I brought the minutes just to refresh my memory what we talked about. And at that point, we presented two documents, one which was a 20-page document, uh, what we proposed for this current fiscal year which was called the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority Public Hearing Document, and it goes into a lot of budget line item detail that we presented to the voters in March. And the second was our strategic plan for 2015 to 2019. And they really form the basis of what we we're attempting to do or trying to do over the next couple months, to get to a decision point to, to make a recommendation of what the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority um, recommends as a uh, uh, for both Montpelier as well as the Central Vermont community of what, what, what we think would be the best step, the ne best next step for um, public safety in Central Vermont. We're starting with dispatch, so obviously our focus this year is dispatch, um, as, as we've discussed. And so most of our discussion this, this year will revolve around that and some strategy points um, in regards to how we think we can get there. Um, the, the objective in January was to um, go to the voters and ask for uh, one more year of funding. Um, we ended up having surplus funds from prior years of about 47, 48,000. So we put that into the pot. And although we're level funded in the money we're proposing to spend, $100,000 from last year and $100,000 this year, 40 of it is accumulated savings from prior years. So we asked, you know, 20, 30, you know, 30 some percent less from each city um, in this current fiscal year to get us to this point. Um, what we had proposed, and I'll have Paco go into it when we get to that point. Uh, we're basically six different uh, performance expectations for 2018, and he can fill us in uh, in a little bit in regards to where we are at that and, and, uh, and, and help you understand uh, you know, what we anticipate over the next couple months and, and how we'll get to a conclusion in the October-November time frame so we're in time for the budget and, and voting for next year, whether or not we decide to go further. Um, we presented these documents for, for the public vote in March, and I'm pleased to report that Montpelier passed this uh, by an 85% margin. I think it was one of our better uh, voter turnouts. Um, collectively, Barry City passed this by about 64%. So collectively, amongst the two towns, it was over 77%. Voter support in the region for at least continued discussion. It's not really a, it's not really a mandate to do anything just yet, but at least it's a mandate to continue looking at whether or not we as a group can collectively uh, come up with a better solution 
so we're not all trying to work in our own individual silos in public safety. And uh, we view dispatch as one of those silos that I think if we work collectively, we can we can help uh, you know expand the pool, possibly offer uh, greater service to the current residents, but then offer our services to more towns because I think technology constraints limit our ability to expand. Um, the five deliverables that I think that uh, Paco will go into were um, exploring the uh, uh, affiliation with the uh, CVPSA of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System. As all of you are aware, or, uh, they're, they're currently a contracted uh, entity with the City of Montpelier that provides, I don't know, 300 and some uh, thousand dollars per year in, in contract revenue. That contract is up in two years, so I imagine there's going to be some negotiations in the next couple of years of how to renew that, how much to charge for that, and what that entails. And that represents uh, 18 to, I don't know how many member towns there are in Capital West that contract with Montpelier, but it's a significant number that represents a, a, a large population base in central Vermont, you know, upwards of 60,000 people you know, in, the, in the surrounding communities. The one deliverable is getting them on board and integrating them in the process. We've had numerous meetings where their executive team as well as their uh, um, uh, communications committee, um, and the plan is that the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System has put on their ballot um, to vote for two seats on our board, and that will come in July. So we anticipate we'll have more information on that, but Paco can fill you in on some of that detail. Second thing is the expansion or looking into the simulcast radio system project, and that would be a way, uh, delivering to this council an idea of how we think it should be funded, how a funding sharing arrangement should be made amongst these member towns, and how Montpelier can help lead this process uh, to, to better integrate or or offset some of the problems with the current dispatch model, you know, uh, fighting Canadian uh, traffic, uh, taxi traffic, um, when we're having emergency uh, service out in Worcester, or not being able to hear because of the, the, the connection and make it more of a digital seamless you know, operation. Second, uh, the third uh, deliverable is the uh, investigation and discussion of a single site dispatching center. Where that is, is to be determined, but we anticipate that a plan will, will come up with those options and give you a funding formula of how to do that. That could range anywhere from keeping it here in Montpelier, adding on where you are, or moving up to the hill in Berlin, or adding somewhere in between. Um, Paco has been intimately involved in tracking uh, some legislation that is in the uh, State Senate um, in regards to uh, uh, dispatch uh, operations. He can get into that. Uh, another deliverable is public outreach. Um, expanding what we're trying to accomplish and, and get that incorporated in our report come October, November. And then the last piece, and, and I think it's an important piece because I think it, it, it can help lead the decision in November, is an exit strategy. Well, what happens if what we propose is too expensive, uh, we're not willing to give up any control, if uh, we can't coordinate any type of payment stream to, to pay for these infra infrastructure expenditures, we want to propose, as well as part of our plan, some type of exit strategy for Montpelier to gracefully exit. You know, we will, in November timeframe, still have half of our fiscal budget. Obviously, that's funds that have been allocated by the the, um, the two cities. We have a sharing arrangement with Barry of a 53-47 split. I imagine that would be on the table in regards to, well, what do we do with that? Do we do we reallocate it in some way that we haven't considered, or do we just give it back to the cities? And that's that's if. At the end of the day, when you hear our report, you don't like it, you don't want to go forward, Barry doesn't like it, Barry doesn't want to go forward, or some, something in between. Um, so with that said, I'll throw it over to Paco. He can expand more on the specifics of what he's been working on and a timeline over the next couple months as we get ready to give you a report come the October-November time frame, which, will, which I think will answer all the questions that were raised in the January time frame, I think. So with that, Paco. Hello, everybody. Uh, for the record, my name is Francis Almond. Everybody calls me Paco. Uh, I am the, uh, I've been serving as the executive director of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority since July of 2015, I believe it was. And uh, I, again, I want to echo there are new members here uh, on, the, on the council. Uh, uh, the chair, Tom, said that um, we'd be more than uh, open to talking about some of the specifics relative to how the authority has evolved over time. Uh, I, I, I guess, having that said, I will uh, presume anyway that there's a fundamental knowledge uh, of, of some of our uh, work such that I can move forward. Uh, we developed uh, 
so several performance expectations for 2018 that had defined deliverables that would ultimately lead in, by November to a go or no go relative to at least the dispatching. And uh, we committed to formulating an exit strategy if the both city councils chose not to move forward. That's the heart of our, uh, of our work this year. The first one is developing another municipality member of CBPSA. And we, we have had over the course of the last two years, two and a half years, certainly I have, talks with both Berrytown and Berlin. They are not interested in joining CVPSA. They weren't when CVPSA was created and they are not currently. But we took a look at uh, the 18 communities that are being dispatched currently by the Montpelier Police Department called Capital West. We then realized we, we peeled back the onion, if you will, to try to define what Capital Fire is and how Capital Fire interacts with Capital West. The short of it is Capital Fire is a mutual aid district that is, by statute, a municipal corporation. Uh, and Capital West, responsible for the 18 communities that are dispatched out of Montpelier, is a communications committee of Capital Fire. So the uh, board of directors felt, I think, fairly strongly that there was a natural linkage between the 31 member municipal corporation called Capital Fire and uh, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. So we have worked to try and develop a memorandum of, under, uh, of agreement that would meet both CVPSA's needs and also Capital Fire's needs. Uh, we formed a negotiating committee, spent a considerable, I think a considerable amount of time over several drafts trying to address and <coughs> negotiate some of their concerns. And we, we got to a document where the committee and the board was very satisfied with. Uh, we had hoped that the vote to join CVPSA would occur on May 16th at their annual meeting. That did not happen. For a variety of reasons, they had uh, many more questions, and uh, we used that date as a way of answering those questions. We spent about an hour and a half talking about uh, a variety of issues. And as a result of that, the organization voted <coughs> to take the question to a vote at their next quarterly meeting, which is July 18th. We also agreed to uh, reconvene the negotiating committee to talk about uh, addressing some of the issues they raised but also to have another informational meeting with them in June. Uh, we continue, certainly I continue to believe very strongly that there is, there is a, a nexus between the two organizations that would be very helpful in trying to coordinate uh, fire and EMS services throughout Central Vermont. The next issue that uh, we, we addressed, we tried to address, is the simulcast radio system project. This is a project of Capital West, primarily. But it's significant because uh, the dispatchers in Montpelier dispatch for Capital West under a contract. And so the radio problems that exist within those 18 different communities uh, have a significant impact on at least the dispatchers. It also has an impact. There are many uh, what we call dead zones, uh, and there are also talkover problems that a simulcast system would, would we believe, would solve. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a Capital West issue. The contract that the city of Montpelier has with Capital West says that it's Capital West. Capital West must provide the radio infrastructure. Uh, but even Capital West will tell you that it needs improvement. Uh, from our perspective, certainly if we were to assume responsibility for the dispatching function, we are, we are very concerned about how that, 
how it continues to impact on the dispatchers. If we can make their lives uh, more efficient, their work lives more efficient, then uh, we think we're all better off, not to mention that it will provide a better service in central Vermont. Uh, we have uh, met to begin talks about this system, this new system. Uh, the Communications Improvement Working Group, which was formed uh, to help guide the single site dispatching and the simulcast radio project, met their first meeting, uh, was targeted at trying to address that issue. It is, while it's a $1.3 million projected project, it can be done in phases and the uh, existing radio infrastructure is a Motorola product and it is, it is a strong consensus of the group that it should be a sole source, uh, sole source consideration relative to any purchasing it should be uh, given some, a lot of thought to uh, moving forward. So we are working uh, on that project, although I must admit it's been stalled uh, somewhat uh, given the uncertainty with the capital fire. Uh, single site dispatching center, uh, you know, we've uh, formed a communications improvement working group that's made up of a variety of employees. We've met twice. I've met separately with uh, a couple people to talk about, a, kind of a subcommittee to talk about radio issues, to talk about facility issues. Uh, I've met with the chiefs of police to talk about business requirements, so if we're moving forward in that area. There is, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, there is uh, a lot of concerns that I have, specifically one of the biggest ones is around a facility. What are we going to do? We talk about single site. Uh, you know, I, I am now on my fifth plan version, and then I know you haven't seen all but one, but I've written uh, plans for five different, I'm on my fifth scenario, and uh, uh, it's uh, the issue that I, we keep hearing is that if CBPSA should take over the uh, dispatching function, it should be out of the existing departments as a standalone single single site. So we're working on that. Uh, the next thing we identified uh, the need to track. Senate Bill 273, which uh, has passed, it has not been signed by the governor as yet. It's in a much different form than when it started. Uh, our original interest, CBPSA and my original interest was because while that bill was, was huge, had a variety of sections in it pertaining to law enforcement, uh, there was one section that was extremely important, important to me and it was the uh, creation of a public safety planning grant process. Um, we finally got the legislator, legislature's attention, at least the government op Senate Government Operations Committee, to uh, recognize that uh, coordinating, consolidating, integrating, regionalization of public safety services was an important item to the state of Vermont and that needed uh, legislative leadership, leadership in the terms of, in terms of uh, authorizing funding for two or more local communities to wanted to get together to study uh, consolidation. In other words, to put money into what both Barry and Montpelier has already, have already done. Uh, that that got a lot of attention and a lot of support at the committee level, but at the end of the day, uh, money being tight, it got uh, eliminated from the bill. But they, we also spent a lot of time testifying, myself, uh, Chief Fakos, Chief uh, Taylor from St. Albans, we spent a considerable amount of time talking about dispatching talking about the uh, inequalities of dispatching services statewide, specifically as it relates to the uh, lack of 
uniform funding for dispatching centers, specifically the fact that the state police provides free dispatching to 105 different agencies. And uh, we all basically agreed that uh, it was time for that to change. And uh, I actually testified that uh, my recommendation would be that if there is not a movement towards creating a fair and equitable formula system, then why should Montpelier and Barry fund their dispatch centers? It's not a new argument. Chief Hoyt presented that argument to the Department of Public Safety many years ago. So it has been an issue that's been around for quite a while. Uh, so I'm going to interrupt you. Um, I just want to be conscious of the time. Okay. Um, I, if you have more things that you definitely want to hit, I want to you know, uh, I'll, give you that I'll opportunity, summarize. but then I, I, wanted, I do want to get to... Yeah. So real, real quickly, uh, the legislature passed a study, a study bill that uh, is part of the past S-273 that uh, calls for the review of a variety of issues of standardization around dispatch, but it's important to note that language was put in this bill that says, in proposing a plan, consideration shall be given to ex existing and planned regional dispatch centers. Uh, outreach, we fully, public outreach, we fully intend to move forward with public uh, out, our outreach, which is what we said. Uh, we'd like to move forward with, uh, I'm calling, uh, educational and listening sessions. Uh, we had, we were starting with one, we had one scheduled, uh, it was to address the uh, Chamber of Commerce breakfast, it got canceled due to lack of interest, and then there's the exit strategy. So thank you very much, and thank you for that yeah, reminder. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure there's probably questions. Yeah. So I have a bunch of questions. So feel free to cut me off. Um, <laughs> okay. So m my first question. I know when you guys were here last, there were um, there were some staff members that were present. I think I see at least one person here. Um, but I was curious. I know that there were some issues that were raised by the staff, and I'm curious to see how the CVPSA has responded to the staff concerns uh, and to the union concerns about sort of how how this new entity would would function uh, working with the union going forward. Well, this year isn't a focus on employee because we're not asking for taking over, assuming management control. That remains with Montpelier. So that issue hasn't been addressed as of yet. We understand it. Uh, we do have union representatives that attend all of our meetings, and so we have we are conscious of that as a concern and so I, I, we are committed to reviewing that uh, as it comes up but with the plan this year we don't intend asking for operational control of the management of employees so we figured it's not a priority in this uh, presentation for, for October November but it is a concern that if we get to the next step will be vitally important in order to uh, integrate uh, with, a, with a different governance model. I just it, it seems like something that the conversation should be started now if if you know, if we're going to move into phase two, we don't want to be sort of caught completely off guard by these issues going forward that we're going to need to address in phase two. Um, additionally, in terms of public outreach, this is this is one of the things I think I had raised when I had met with you, and then uh, additionally when you folks were here, um, one of the things that I am really interested in hearing from are the professionals and the and the volunteer forces that we work with mm -hmm. that get dispatched. I, I want to make sure that they're concerns and their thoughts and their recommendations are being listened to as part of this plan as well. And I think the community piece is also significant. I mean, I know uh, people have strong feelings about the thought of like picking up a phone in a lobby as opposed to like having an individual there. And, and I want to make sure that we get all of the stakeholders. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And, and I sat in with a dispatch uh, center in Barry City and I realized they had one person on and, and I think it, it fundamentally highlights a problem when we each try to do it alone in silos. So I totally agree with you. Um, and one of the other things, and uh, I had mentioned this earlier, um, but I'm, I'm going to bring it up for everyone. So uh, in terms of how we're planning on going forward, um, I know that this has been a, a sort of work in progress for, for years at this point. Um, and I'm sort of at a point, and I think it sounds like we're in agreement that come November, we either have an upvote or a downvote, and we move forward either one of two ways. Uh, and, it, and it seems to me that the best way to do that is to do all of the listening, to hear from all of the stakeholders about what their positions are, but, but ultimately, I think that the councils need to meet together with the CVPSA so that y'all can get an idea for where we're coming at this from. And, and I don't think that meeting in this way, just meeting with Montpelier in our silo and meeting with Barry in its silo, um, is really the most conducive way to figure out where the meeting of the minds is and where it isn't and what areas we can sort of find common ground and, and how, to, how to work those 
pieces to see if there even is a workable solution. Um, and so I feel very strongly, and I don't know how my fellow council members feel about this, but I think um, that it would make sense towards the end of the summer. Um, you know, well, it sounds like there's a vote in July, so you'll know then whether um, whether we'll have new members in Capital West. Um, but I, I think at that point, the councils just need to get together because if there's no way for us to agree on this, there's no point in 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 going further and putting together a plan that's just going to to get voted down if there's no clear path forward. Um, and I, I think as a, as the president of this council, I'd be remiss in my duty if, if I said I want to spend any more time and taxpayer dollars on something that there's no possible way for any of us to move forward. And I think the council probably shares that view, and I'm sure Barry feels similarly. So I, I would encourage you, um, and I'm not comfortable doing anything until both councils meet together with the CVPSA to figure out agreement, disagreement, and if there is a way to address those in a plan moving forward. Well, you know, we met with Barry City last night. We had a very positive conversation about the same exact, you know, presentation model. And, and I, you know, so we have a good working relationship with, with Mayor Herring and Mayor Watson. So I, I, I think we will explore how we get together. But there will be unique differences that may make a path successful for Montpelier, but not successful for Barry. So there may be a path that we may want to consider as Montpelier that Montpelier takes the lead and we use Montpelier's model to jumpstart a regional entity already because of your capital uh, west exposure. So I wouldn't preclude the idea that, yes, you may meet, but there may be differences of opinion well, that would make the progress work faster. Right. And that's, I just, I, as a council member, I think I need to know what that is so that I have an understanding of what all of the risks, benefits, costs, non-costs are to, to our city and, and sort of where Barry is at in that regard. And obviously we have, we have options, Barry has options, but if the CVPSA is going to be the option, I want to hear from, from both councils what that option looks like. And, and in the meantime, I'd encourage you to attend our board meetings. You know, I feel that the disconnect a little bit with CVPSA and the Montpelier Council has been when we went down from only one council rep, from two to one. And so I feel that when Don and I both, as the council reps, we would bring it back in our internal council discussions so the other council members would feel a little bit more comfortable. I really believe that having another council rep to help us get to the next step would be extremely helpful. Now, if that means I can step aside and, and offer it to one of you, I'd be happy to do so. I would be happy to continue on in an ancillary role with a no voting right. I don't care. I, I'm really committed to regionalization, and I think Montpelier is better served by having council reps during our discussions. I don't believe you want to meet every time we're meeting. I, I heard your schedule this week, and I know you met Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. <laughs> Spend more time and if you with, want to meet Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday Wednesday, husband. Thursday, <laughs> because we meet on Thursdays, Ashley, more power to you. But I, I think um, I would give some benefit to the fact that you have a really good, cohesive board that's professional, that will come back with a representation that may not be exactly what Montpelier wants, but will try to blend everything we hear from all of our discussions. I'm more than happy to have you be part of all, every one of our discussions, but I have no, also no problem adding that joint meeting with Barry. But I think that's something we can discuss. And we, I mean, if at the soonest you're thinking end of the summer, I mean, there's going to be this vote in July. Right. We should just touch base after yeah. that. Yeah. And, uh, and that's so what they. Lucas asked me yesterday. He said, "Well, what would be a good next step for Barry City?" And I said, "We'll probably wait till after the Capital West vote mm -hmm. and see what that looks like, um, and then go from there." And 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 again, I'll put this out there. I mean, I had I had put my name in, and then when Tom, you indicated that you were still you were you still wanted to continue serving, I, I withdrew my own name because I think you have institutional knowledge that is incredibly valuable. I am happy to to sort of be the person from the council that goes um, this week. Probably not. This is my third <laughs> night. <laughs> and maybe council you know, maybe but. it's, it's intermittent. I, I just think it's good to have extra council eyes on where we're leading. Because if we start leading in a direction that you don't feel Montpelier would support or encourage, you know, we do hear good feedback from Tony and, and Bill. But it's also good to have council feedback, you know, at different stages of this. And, and uh, uh, you know, I'd like to make it through at least in November just to see where this thing goes. Is because I spent so many years on it. But you know, I do think having that extra, you know, Montpelier focus, whether it's an existing member. Or, I don't know. Yeah, so I throw it out there. Any other questions? I, I do have a question, and I, uh, 
I know I'm exposing my ignorance here, but uh, but this state police thing really has me wondering. You said there are 105 towns that are being dispatched by the state police. Is one is that just sort of a historical accident, and two could Montpelier and Barry both say to the state police, well, we're just not going to do dispatch anymore, so it's in your lap because someone has to do it. You know, not not saying that would necessarily the former be deputy de deputy commissioner forward. But I, I think that I have the institutional knowledge that this is sufficiently answered that question. <laughs> Regarding the latter uh, about uh, really pressuring the state state police to take over the dispatching services for for, my, uh, for Barry and Montpelier, that really wouldn't happen. It's the, it, it, the services are beyond their capacity to be able to provide a, a dispatching service. Uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, charging departments uh, dates back to, or lack of charging, dates back to the early 70s when the Department of Public Safety uh, received a significant federal grant to first uh, establish an analog microwave network throughout the state, and then in a follow-up grant, they uh, came up with an idea of providing regional dispatching services to all police departments. And so that gave birth to the state police providing, they got the grant, they got the money to hire additional staff, and that gave birth to the idea that they would provide dispatching services to, then it was just law enforcement. Over the years, with the advent of 911, uh, fire departments in the need to get away from red phones went looking for dispatching services and settled on the state police. In the 80s, the state police started to realize that they cannot, from a budgeting perspective, cannot keep up with the demand for uh, dispatching service. Departments that started in the 70s were growing significantly in the 80s and the, uh, the, the staff just did not keep up. So there was a, a move by the state police to try to uh, uh, encourage agents, some law enforcement agencies to create their own dispatching. Uh, some did, but most, uh, a lot stayed with the state police. And uh, some, as some new members or new departments came on, the state police started charging them. I think there was at least uh, maybe a handful, 10, 12, that were being charged. And the former commissioner of public safety, realizing that it was an inequitable uh, funding solution, said, I'm no longer going to charge anymore. The agencies that we started charging are, no, are going to get it free until somebody, like the legislature, resolves the question of funding. I can weigh in on that too, Jack. Um, some time ago, in fact, I may have been you that I sent the letter to, I can't remember, the Chief Hoy actually um, was here. I'm sorry, a number of years ago, and I don't know, I couldn't tell you when it was, 15 years ago, something like that, we sent a letter to the state basically saying we were exploring the option of discontinuing our dispatch service and we were giving them, you know, nine months notice or something that as of Ju coming July 1, we were going to take advantage of the, the same services that everybody else in the state got. And essentially got the answer that, you know, we just can't do it and you're putting your citizens at risk. And so we then raise or I raise the issue, well, then perhaps we should get us, our, our residents should get some sort of income tax credit for the, since we're in anybody else who provides a, a um, dispatch since you're giving it free. And that, you know, didn't get very far. <laughs> but this is this isn't a this isn't a new issue, and I think it, it is one that that causes a problem, and it's one of the actual you know it's one of the obstacles between even with our regional system because some of our neighboring towns that aren't joining are getting free dispatch, and you know you can't blame them. Uh, so, uh, it just seems like a crazy non-system. <laughs> That's exactly what it well, is. Well, if you if if I may take a couple more minutes, sure. uh, I'll give you a, a, another crazy example of where dispatching needs to be, uh, there needs to be some effort to try to standardize dispatching. So there's a severe uh, motor vehicle accident at Berlin Four Corners, as an example. So the poor person who's injured picks the phone, calls 911. That 911 call is answered in uh, Williston. 
The Berlin Police Department is dispatched by the state police out of Williston. The Berrytown Ambulance Service is dispatched by uh, Lamoille County Dispatch. And uh, Berlin Fire Department, which is part of Capital West, is dispatched out of Montpelier. So that 911 call taker who gets that call has to figure out, well, let's see, we hear the state police to dispatch, and then uh, Lamoille County and Montpelier. Uh, and so it is a, it's, it's a system that, that example highlights a system that is, uh, that needs improvement. Uh, everybody has grown up, if you will, Don't have an accident receiving <laughs> uh, uh, services, and we get by. But at, if you look at dispatching from a systemic perspective, it needs to be fixed. Uh, and I'm not saying what we're doing is necessarily going to fix it, but we would hope that we, by, by trying to create a system, a unified system in central Vermont, that we might be able to lead the way to allow um, other customers to come into it. Uh, one of our operating principles is to expand and develop our services. So I want to check uh, check in with you all. If any other questions? Also, I mean, uh, the teacher in me really wants to do like a checking for understanding. You know what I mean? Like, how to, was this helpful? You know, did, did you find this useful? I'm, I'm hoping the answer is yes. Okay, excellent. Very good. I'm sure there are some comments from the public. Um, so, if any questions um, from the public, now is the time. I don't have questions. I've got some comments. That's fair. Uh, just try to uh, keep it to two minutes or less. Uh, that's not fair. Uh, uh, so, that's actually uh, a standard that we're trying to set for all of our meetings. If you have more things to say beyond that, that's fine. Just give it I'll, to us and write. I'll be concise. Okay. Uh, at this point, I like the idea that we need to see a clear pass forward. It's not sufficient to have an exit strategy and then be back to where we were three years ago. I commend that there's been some good work done, but we're on the wrong path. We're, in, we're really in a, a governance uh, minefield with this idea that the two cities are going to be joined by the duly appointed representatives to a 31-town district. Capital, capital Fire, Mutual Aid, of which their bylaws allow 10% of them to constitute a quorum. So four people could show up to a meeting, three of them vote to join, and then you've got 31 towns represented by two seats on this board. And this board cannot succeed unless it is has the membership and the buy-in from Berlin, Barrytown, possibly Northfield, possibly Waterbury. So this idea that they're shooting for might be attainable 10 years from now, but in the meantime, we need to set our sights realistic. We need to focus on the priorities of communications planning. Public safety is based on communications, and this idea of a sole source million dollar radio system, you know, without integration with where our cellular dead zones are, where we want to put microcells, is absolutely absurd. That should be a blazing red flag for y'all. So uh, we need to inventory. That's why I mentioned earlier, and I'll share these. Here's a map of pretty close to accurate map of the both the member towns in the Communications Union District and the member towns in the Capital West, the, the subset uh, in the dispatcher. Um, they are so similar that, again, I'm going to propose you consider investigating, not waiting till November to investigate whether the communication union district model, one town, one vote, civilian governance might be a better place to explore public safety communications. Uh, originally, this was sold to the towns as, or the cities as two sites with failover and redundancy. Somehow it evolved into one site, which lacks both failover and redundancy. That's another red flag. Um, you add the $1.3 million simulcast system to a building, to a dispatch outfit console, and you're into the over $10 million at least. Um, the governance minefield, I 
I believe this will be voted down. I'd rather us not lose another six months. That I don't believe Capital Fire Mutual Aid is going to vote to join. I don't think Barry City is going to vote to cede their authority. If we could early, sooner than later, set aside the whole concept of ceding our authority and get focused on the communications, build the trust, build the cooperation, solve the dead zones, you then might have a foundation to build on towards sharing fire trucks and, and satellite etc. Uh, I'm concerned that we will end up with an exit strategy and be further behind than we need to be unless you get engaged now and start thinking about what can run in parallel with this. Uh, professional development. I, I got a call. I spoke to the Barry City Council last night. I got a call from a former Barry Town uh, Select Board member and this idea that Berlin is currently dispatched for free on a 20-year elusive agreement in, in exchange for having hosted the mental hospital. And Barry's town went to Lamoille because they're unhappy with the quality of the dispatching that they're getting, the professionalism of Barry City. That tells me that we should be focused on professional development. We will, we, we will reach the level of cooperation and trust to form a unified district by focusing on training and, and professional development. We're not doing that right now. Uh, so how much more do you have there? I think, I think I've covered enough. Okay. I think you got the idea. Thank you. I think those are great, great uh, points to consider. And, uh, you know, when we have something uh, concrete to look at, we'll keep those things in mind. Thank Could you. I, um, yes, Jeff. Can I ask one question of Steve about sure. these maps? What, what are these uh, little dots on the maps? Is there a legend? Those are the microcells that are currently on or off. Uh, that's a new crisis. Uh, coverage code, we should be aware. Coverage code paid 8000 to get consolidated to restore. And co consolidated communication turned them all off today. So we got a new public safety emergency to fight. Thank you. Bringing that to our attention. Uh, assuming there's no other questions. All right, thank you all for being here. Thank you, appreciate thank you for your thank you for being time. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Super, thank you. Okay. And Ashley, tell me how to start cutting hair. June 1st. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so on to the downsizers group. Would it be possible to just take like a couple minutes? Um, Carrie and Jay, do you mind if we take a couple minute break? Please do. Okay. <laughs> Super. We're going to take, <laughs> take a five-minute break. Thank you. All our break over now that everybody's back. Um, and uh, welcome, uh, <laughs> Carrie you. and Jay. Uh, thanks for being here. So tell us about the downstairs. Okay. This is something I think a lot of the council knows about, but just to kind of give a really quick um, update, the Montpelier um, Downsizing Group was founded about three and a half years ago by Phil Dodd. Um, and about six months after I had <clears throat> heard about it through Fran, his wife, um, I got involved just from the standpoint of becoming part of. And it's kind of grown, and we have a, an email update that will go out, and we have um, meetings. We used to do them every six months, but we're now doing them about once a year and then sending out an update. Um, this is for people who have larger homes, whether in or out of Montpelier, who want to downsize. Most of us are seniors. Um, we don't need to live on our, you know, have our bedrooms on the second floor and all of our living on the main floor, etc. cetera. So um, we put together <clears throat> this group, and uh, there's now about 200 on the database. And that's not everybody. That's only a local. So um, we decided we were going to try to drive this a little bit harder, and we created a smaller, what I call a core group, um, of interested downsizers who want to downsize within, say, two years. And so we have about now about 10 or 11 households who are kind of ready to commit. We've actually given ourselves a name. We're called the Silver Maple Group. And um, we are now looking to form an LLC. Um, and you're looking into what is the legal entity, is it a, it's a condominium association, etc. We've been looking at properties 
Um, whenever anything comes up, I usually hightail it up and go have a look at it. <clears throat> um, so we are looking at three to four within the city limits. Everybody wants to be within Montpelier. Of course, everybody wants to be within walking distance, but when you have a topography the way Montpelier has, it's <laughs> walking to town is, you know, sometimes optional <laughs> or <laughs> not possible. Um, so we were looking at how the downsizers can positively affect the city because when you retire, you have a little extra time and you, even though you've gotten rid of a lot of stuff, that means you have to go buy a lot of stuff. So, you know, you are very, we're very active in the community. There have been a number of people I've talked to who are from outside the city and who said, oh, we want to be in Montpelier because for such a small city, there's so much going on, we can always be involved. So besides bringing people in from outside, so say about a quarter of our group aren't currently living in Montpelier. So you are bringing in additional revenue because we're looking at affordable market rate. We're not, there's enough, there's plenty of affordable housing being developed now and coming onto the market as far as availability is concerned, but that doesn't give us. So we say we have a 2,000, 2,500, whatever it is, square foot house, going to an 800 square foot apartment is a bit of a challenge. So having our own home, but a much smaller, within the city limits is ideal. And if you have a look at pocket neighborhoods, you can just Google pocket neighborhoods and a lot of information comes up. So that's the idea. 800, 1200 square foot um, homes. And these would be within the TIF district so that we would be able to um, be close to town um, and be involved in the community. So um, we're asking basically for the support of the council in helping us move this forward when the opportunity arises. And I don't mean to be vague because Jay is the one that has all the more specifics. Um, and um, we want to stay part of the city and stay very involved in the city. And um, I'm not even from Vermont, so I'm relatively new as of 2002. So, um, you know, I'm happy to be here and <laughs> get involved. <laughs> I'll try to be professionally vague. Um, <laughs> I compliment your efforts on sustainable Montpelier with all your laptops instead of printed material. And although I see Bill has the printed copy. Jim, Jim, I, Jay, I'm sorry. Could you move that over? Closer. There we go. Better? If you can, I couldn't hear you. Okay. I assume you've availed yourself of a digital tab instead of sheet music. <laughs> your guitar. So anyway, I've been working with the group for perhaps a year and a half or so. There are a lot of varied interests. Uh, the smaller group that Carrie mentioned is mostly interested in a cottage uh, or a duplex cottage as opposed to apartment, and there's many who are interested in a more of an apartment uh, type of arrangement. Uh, some of them are interested in ownership and others rental, so there's kind of a mix there. It's probably a little bit more ownership. It might be a condominium uh, than the rental option. And again, some wanting apartment and some cottage. Uh, this uh, concept of pocket neighborhood is quite exciting where there's sort of a, a gathering of homes in a close proximity, less infrastructure costs, they have shared community uh, spaces, they can look out for one another, uh, shared maintenance, etc. So that has some real benefits and creates a, an exciting neighborhood. Some of them want to maintain one automobile and have parking within their structure, others a pair, and there are some who would be happy with uh, no car and they want to be sort of a walkable environment, which I think is a, a goal that we're looking for more toward for Montpelier. Uh, as she mentioned, most of them do want to maintain and remain in Montpelier, and some of those who have had that sort of territorial imperative that moved out to Calais and Middlesex want to come back in, and that will certainly be a benefit to our community. It will also then free up their homes for families and, and others. Um, we've looked at a number of sites, as she mentioned. Um, and a lot of them have some aspect of flaw that, that is an issue, whether it be location or utility availability or access or topography uh, or cost. So we're trying to come up with uh, a couple where they can be more viable and not have some of those issues. As mentioned, there are many programs that benefit uh, low-income housing. The French Block, which we're doing across the street, has been vacant for 75 years, and it's the programs that have enabled that to take place, or those that are going to be at Taylor or potentially Christ Church. But there's very little that can assist with affordability for market rate and, and this group. 
Uh, the TIF district is certainly one that can be of some assistance, and we've had some communication with Sue and Grazer, and, and it looks as though some of those potential areas will be included within the district, and we would certainly encourage that. Obviously, they have to pass uh, muster before any bond vote and prove that they are viable and will help contribute. Um, there are still some other hurdles, and one of those that has, has is still there, and I think we're hoping to see some adjustments on, has to do with zoning. Uh, they're always, as you know, Montpelier passed its new, after a lot of study, new zoning ordinance. And as one starts to apply new ordinances, there are discoveries and things that perhaps were not necessarily intended but need to be adjusted. Um, there were changes to density. Um, many areas within the city will allow somewhat higher density. And there were also areas that were, in effect, down downsized relative to the number of units that could be uh, built within them. About a third of the city now is going to be rural, uh, which you need two acre minimums per house. And that was probably of a, of a lesser density than it had been. Another area, one that we had been looking at, was a residential 24,000, where you would need 24,000 square feet per home. There also that go with that are some requirements for open space that then cuts down the availability of area or some requirements on what that open space can be. In one area that I was looking at, in theory, by the R24,000, we could have had 11 homes, but after I apply all of these sort of lesser fine print aspects, I can put five. Uh, can you build roads and infrastructure for five homes? Probably not. Um, so those are some things that maybe need some adjustment. We've had discussions with Mike, who recognizes some of these things, and some of them were simply oversights. Uh, and I think he's coming to Planning Commission and then probably to you uh, on some of those. Uh, there are also some tools within the zoning that can help with higher densities or neighborhoods. There's one called uh, New Neighborhood and Plan Unit Development. However, these are not applicable in a number of the areas, the R24,000, uh, the rural, the eastern and western gateways. There are some nice and potential new neighborhoods in some of the eastern and western gateways, uh, which would not be seen. They might be seen as a gateway, but you're not going to see them because they just aren't visible. So I think, for instance, that's an area where, if those were allowed, could could provide for some, some nice neighborhoods um, that should be done. Um, so what can the City Council do? Again, uh, we met with Mike, and he's been looking to make some of these changes in zoning, and I would encourage you to sort of approve those when they, when they come to you. Uh, the TIF district, glad to hear tonight that that was, was approved and uh, will potentially be available. Um, this, the permitting process is one that that uh, uh, has been sort of long and lengthy in my pillar and sometimes has scared people, but I think there have been some movements toward making that a little more streamlined, and I'm feeling pretty good about that, that that would be, uh, be seen as an option. One of the other restrictions that we are running into um, one of these properties for some multi-unit is a slope restriction, where you can't disturb any slope greater than 30%, 30% or greater. Well, if, and the same relates to some of our road requirements. If we looked at those requirements, probably much of Montpelier wouldn't exist uh, because of its slopes. I think one thing that's often good in looking at some requirements that are about to be applied within the city municipalities to look at the existing city and the portions that you know and love and if you apply these new rules, could they form? If they couldn't, then maybe they should be rethought of it. Um, we've talked like that with Tom McCardle on looking at how we were going to use some creative aspects of one of the slopes sites working into the hillside, and we felt that would be fine conceptually. And what was in portion of the ordinance, and I would think would be fine here, would be that for anything within those slopes, you would require that they be engineered and that you have approval by public works and or whatever body. So they could certainly go through and make sure they're meeting all requirements. I think part of the reasoning, there have been developments in Montpelier that were of slopes and without proper erosion control, and there definitely were problems. So I don't disagree that it should be looked at, but I wouldn't just say summarily that they can't happen. Otherwise, it would be eliminating some of the options, that some of which, such as along Berry Street, that have been thought about for, by many people and be an area that is quite viable and acceptable. Um, there are a number of groups that are looking at options for transportation, whether it be shuttles, bike paths, other kinds of combinations of transportation. Uh, 
much of you know, when we participated in the Teen Bridges uh, concept, much of that was sort of transportation-based development, and that some of these transportation aspects can happen, a lot of that development could occur. A portion of it also being the concept of some remote parking, where we'd have lots where people could come park, and then hopefully if we get the bug cars running, uh, they could come into town and not need to park in town, nor would you need uh, that level of additional traffic. And uh, service parking can probably be developed at perhaps about $2,000 a space rather than the $28,000 per space for a parking structure. So it's you know, fairly economical. Um, there are some, still some continued interest in having the added transportation, such as the foot cars, but concern for the track conditions and such, which would need some improvements. Um, I recently noticed that some uh, granite filled cars and engines running through town a couple of weeks ago at about 800,000 pounds of butt cars, 100,000 pounds. So is that really a problem? Uh, so I think we don't have any specific asks of you tonight, but I think if there's sort of a general support, I, I get a sense that this council would like to see more housing. And uh, uh, there will certainly be wherever one proposes a project, there'll be those who don't want it. And, uh, uh, well, I think one thing that will happen here that will be a little different that not a bunch of this group will be coming to for approval will be the neighbors asking from neighbors. And hopefully that will have some positive impact and see the benefits uh, to the city. Um, so if there are any other thoughts that you guys might have of ways to get help, we're certainly open to those. We probably will be soon looking, particularly if the zoning, some of the things we're looking at will need to have the zoning changes. And once we know they're in place and we're viable, we pers be pursuing specific designs and then coming through the design and permitting process with the city. Just a couple of things I neglected to mention that um, our whole goal is to be able to age in place. You know, there's nobody who wants to go into a nursing home, and you now everyone wants to be able to. So we're talking about very senior friendly. You know, everybody help everybody else out, and that's not really co-housing, but. You know, thinking along those lines where you're part of a community. So you have an immediate community, and then you have the Montpelier, greater Montpelier community, and then you have your virtual community. So you actually have three integrated communities. And something that we're talking about, one reason for getting the four group going, is that we could be a model for other types of neighborhoods like this once once they're, you know, constructed and people are moving in and they're, they're happy. You could. There are other locations within Montpelier city limits where that actually could work. It'd be, it could be multi-generational, it could be senior, it could be whatever. But a lot of millennials don't really want big houses. You know, there'll be quite a few of them who at least will be able to sell ours houses. But when it comes to um, the next generation, you know, not everybody can afford a, a big house. So it would be nice to be able to have smaller <clears throat> communities that are multi-generational too. Uh, comments. Yes, Don. Oh, I didn't see it on the attachment. Did you send us any of those points about zoning? Jay? I did a, sort of a rough agenda, but I can send you, you the more specifically. Yes. Okay. I think they will. They'll be coming to you, but sure. Okay, that would be great. We we did meet with Jay and Carrie and Mike, and I think we agree with they largely agree with their analysis. And I know I believe they're being brought forward to the planning commission to come. We've got a whole list of zoning fixes. I think we're targeting sometime in summer July or so to, to do that. So I think they'll be coming before well, this. The three big ones to me was the square footage of the units or the building itself the, and then the, the lot, lot size and slopes. Right. Yeah, the square footage is of the lot size. So how many can you put on, say, an acre? Right. Okay. All the comments. No. Um, so uh, just in terms of, you know, taking the temperature of the council at this point, I mean, I just want to offer um, that, uh, you know, the, the uh, couple of requirements that you mentioned uh, about open space, you know, given that I think it's, we landed at 40% um, of the, the land had to be kept open. If you, you know, that's something that I'm sympathetic to if you want to, um, if we want to adjust that up or down, mostly down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and I think you mentioned that the, the new neighborhood PUD is not available in 24,000. Or that, uh, Eastern Gateway or Western or, Gateway okay. or That's, rural. That seems something that I'm certainly, you know, open to talking about. The slope restriction um, gives me more pause. It makes me nervous to um, think about changing that. 
And the reason is because I, I have made some, to be fair, I have made some assumptions that the 30% grade is based on some science. And, um, and I appreciate, you know, your thinking there about, you know, there's a difference between saying nothing can happen there, um, nothing is ever good, <laughs> you know, on a 30% grade versus if you want to build a 30% grade, here's what you need to do so that you don't destroy the bank. Um, and that's what we read. Ask right, Sorry. and that's that's fair. I I guess I would just ask that that be uh, robustly supported in science, <laughs> and then I will be very yeah, happy. I think you'd need a stamped engineer approval that you're not going to have issues. Okay. And uh, okay, uh, I mean that seems like a, a subtle nuance that uh, you know we would have been easily easy to overlook. You know, in the, the first time around, I'm just saying. No, we're not going to. We actually just looked at something along those lines. In one iteration, and I don't remember if it was the final. I guess it wasn't, but we considered it. I thought. <laughs> I don't remember, but that's entirely possible. <laughs> I, I would say w one of the areas that have been identified as prime housing by many groups would not be possible if that stays in place. I'm, just can't, I'm sorry. What? What? One of the possible? areas along Berry Street that has been identified as a prime area for some multi-housing would not be possible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, other comments or questions? Uh, yes, I guess I would just say that um, you were, you know, wondering about support from the city in general and um, the tax stabilization policy is also an avenue for right. developments to request assistance. So just that's available for housing as well as other um, developments. Great. All right. Yes, it is. Commercial housing, it's not residential. Well, depending on the depending scenario. on the structure of the housing, <laughs> potentially you'd be able to. No, I, yeah, I was just trying. I wasn't trying to call it. <laughs> All right. Any other comments from the public on this? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So the community services presentation. Senior Activity Center, Recreation, and Parks. I actually am wondering if you should fix it. I mean, if they're, if it's city staff. Yeah, I mean, if it's just city staff here to do anything. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. that way we don't. Yeah. Is anyone interested in a hard copy? So, Jenna, we, we may be flipping the order here oh, okay. um, for the sake of the... Um, sure thing. Yeah. I love hard copies. Uh, our volunteers who are here. Um, so let's let's come back to that. Sorry, so sorry, Jeff and Arnie. We're going to fl flip the order here um, a little bit. So let's go to the Conservation Commission presentation and then the tree board. Does that sound great? What's on the right team? Try to be quick. We have a lot going on. <laughs> a lot going on. It's true. It's all good. Do you have a, a PowerPoint presentation? No, no we do not. We're the conservation commission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to use the BTUs. Paper and pencil. That's right. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, yeah, if you'd introduce yourselves. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm James Brady, the chair of the conservation commission. I took over from Roy Schiff um, at the beginning of 2017, and um, kind of taking this, we have a kind of like a new kind of like a renaissance going with a, a nice big full group right now. So, um, Paige Curtin, thank you for appointing me to the Conservation Commission. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of background on the last few years under my leadership, and I. Um, took over the group right at kind of like a prime time for a, for a shift. And we had worked with um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife and their community programs to help come up with a strategic uh, planning matrix for our, our commission to kind of like look out about roughly the next five years or so. And so we kind of met um, as a group and we threw everything against the wall see what would stick and we, we came up with our list and our with our priorities and it was a long list and it was um, some really great things that people are getting really excited about um, 
and so basically when that's ex when I took over, so I was kind of like handed the keys to this kingdom. Here you go. Here's your marching orders. Here's your team. Um, see if you can make anything happen. So um, <laughs> it was a is a big group, very excited group. So I kind of felt like very personally responsible to not let everybody down because we had some serious momentum going and um, some really great ideas, some great energy. So. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Paige. So, we we hit the ground running with this momentum, but then we kind of stopped and decided that we should probably be doing some housekeeping because it had been a while since um, we had gone over the um, actually the, the full membership of the commission and whether the alternates were ever officially um, adopted by the city council. All this stuff, kind of like paperwork and stuff that had been kind of lost over time or, or a little bit. So okay. we um, we worked hard over that kind of the first couple of months there to to officially um, bring our group to full capacity and we learned during this process that we had two seats that were vacant that we didn't even know we had. So we have a little bit of an unusual circumstance where we're um, kind of under state statute. So state statute says nine members and we had been operating with seven, so we're like, okay, great. Um, so not only did we have that, we started getting a lot of interest from folks in the community about joining and what was going on. So we wanted to make sure that our alternate positions were um, officially by the book and everything, because we we're starting to get this, this groundswell of, of momentum. We want to make sure we're doing everything right. So um, normally commissions don't have alternates. But since we were limited to that nine members, we decided to pursue it because of all this um, momentum and energy and, and, and ideas that we had going. And we needed, we needed people. So um, adding those alternates kind of give us um, more of that people power that we needed to, to kind of implement our strategic planning matrix. And thank you for kind of officially adopting that. And when that was adopted, you may recall we had a, a large group of uh, applicants for the commission, and I kind of saw that as a mandate to like, okay, you got everything kind of your ducks in a row. Let's let's actually get stuff on the ground. So, um, we met late last year. We went at Hubbard Park because we're the conservation commission. We hadn't met outside this room for who knows how long, and so I was like, we should meet in Hubbard Park, and we're gonna we're gonna clear the agenda. We're gonna pick kind of like our our top priorities from this huge list that we came up with. And um, Montpelier is an interesting area. So we're geographically small. We're a population center in a larger context. It's, it's often hard to think outside political boundaries. You have to do that for ecology and natural resources. Um, and we have this responsibility to kind of to, to work on that growth here and kind of we're not going to be preserving thousands of acres of land. We don't have that. So what rose to the list pretty quickly was our stormwater um, master plan and uh, the kind of the low-hanging fruit there and stuff, the projects that are in that master plan that we could handle as a commission to help out public works, to help water quality, to, um, to get things moving, to increase public outreach, and I'm going to actually switch the page, and so we have our first project kind of like officially started here. If you want to give some details on that. Um, we are, there are several of us, we, we decided to do, since we only meet once a month, we have some sort of ad hoc groups that work on particular projects. And so we have a, a group that's um, doing, that's working on stormwater project, projects, and um, <clears throat> there are, uh, the city is doing all the, the is working on stormwater projects that are in the master plan that are on public land. And so we are kind of looking at taking on as many of the projects that are, um, look like they're priority projects that are on private land. And um, so the first place we're starting with is a very visible location at the Vermont State Employees Credit Union. Um, the intersection of the bike path, Bailey Avenue, the um, entrance to the uh, credit union and the entrance to the high school. 
there's a, a catch basin there that drains a fairly large portion of their parking lot. So um, there's a group of us that are trying to, or working on designing um, and implementing a rain garden that will manage some of the flow of the water from that point. And it will be a really visible location that if we can pull it off and make it as beautiful as I hope we can, that will be um, um, able to be used as kind of an educational site for helping people understand what we can do with rain gardens and whatever. And, um, and the credit union is excited about that because they want benches and they want to make a little park and you know whatever. So it, it, it's actually working out really well so far. Um, turns out to be a bit of a challenging site, but we're working on, on design right now. And, uh, Who's funding that? Good question. Um, we have a certain amount of money in the Conservation Commission's um, budget set aside for matching for grants. And once we get a, our design set up and we will have um, some budgetary things put together, then we'll start applying for grants. Sean White's been helping me with that. Oh, for, yeah. Friends with the Mosque. Friends with the Mosque, yeah. So she's amazing. Um, and um, so, yeah, then we'll, we'll apply for grants. And uh, see how that goes. Um, so yeah, we're hoping to get that done sometime this summer if we can do it. Uh, and it's like I said, it's a bit of a challenging site. We're trying to figure out how to how deep, how big, you know, whatever, what will happen with overflows. And so it's great. It's a fun project. <coughs> and uh, that's where we're starting. There's uh, something like 21 identified. Um, stormwater projects, potential projects on private lands in the stormwater master plan. So that's kind of my focus anyway for this, mm -hmm. this uh, go around. Yeah, yeah we'll, thanks. We'll so Paige has been doing a ton of work um, on, on implementing that. And kind of jumping off of that, so the it's next to the public uh, publicly used uh, bike path. And so the education and outreach component is something that we also kind of yes. think that we can really um, move forward on once again kind of we're not looking to do wildlife corridor type of work we public outreach we have a you know a very well attended farmers market that we hope to start attending and kind of just we have a million ideas of like a you know species of the month or something like that just to kind of get out there get our face out there um, and start doing more public outreach and education so that's um, that's one of our other top priorities that kind of rose to that level um, so that's what we're working on for this summer. And then I just also want to mention that um, prior to, basically in 2017, we, uh, we were, uh, were able to, to implement our natural resources priority inventory mapping into the, the zoning that was adopted earlier this year. And so um, one of the first things that we worked on was making sure that we're prepared for when a plan use development or subdivision comes through and could possibly impact um, resources that we have mapped so we're ready to go because we don't want to slow the process down or not do a good job, obviously. Right. right, so, um, and we kind of had a dry run of that and this is kind of a, one of our, our victories from this, this year was um, Mamba's been working on upgrading mountain biking trails near the North Branch Nature Center and working with um, the Parks Commission, they had asked for this trail network to be reviewed through natural resources inventory mapping, the same one that's in the zoning. So they came, uh, Mamba folks came to our meeting, and it turns out that the trail was, is going to be within not only the, um, the buffer that we had suggested for protecting vernal pools, but the state regulated buffer. So um, not only did are we gonna help them with the design to make this, possibly even better for the vernal pool around it, but also um, avoiding potential concerns for state regulatory issues. So win, win, win. So um, <laughs> very cool. Um, we're really, really excited about that. And that kind of just kind of fell on the plate. And this outreach, this mapping, the, the work that we've been working on for years kind of helped us get to that point. Um, um, so obviously public outreach, we, um, another thing that's been dormant has been the conservation fund. And that is a, a pot of money separate from conservation uh, commission uh, allotted budgeting annually. 
that can go towards preserving everything from uh, natural areas to parkland, even to agricultural. It's very broad. Um, but that group is hasn't been um, active for quite some time, so it's hard to find some of the inf official information on that. So we um, we staffed that as a commission. So we, there's three conservation commission members and two at-large members of the public. And so we have a lead, uh, Brenna, who will be working with, with the, the council soon to kind of get that going. And that's another thing, so if a project comes up, we're ready to go. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting and uh, unique tool to the Conservation Commission that we don't want to not use or not be prepared to use. So I have a couple questions about that. Yeah, Do course. we know how much is in there? It's uh, 40000 And can we use it to potentially take down ash trees? I don't see why not. I think it was intended for easements and, and or fee simple purchases. Okay. Just checking. But um, I'd be happy to talk to you about Emerald Ash We can talk, Wars, we can uh, talk about. Well, I think we're going to talk about that probably yeah, pretty soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah these. Yeah, right. I just don't. I, you don't need to even talk to me about that. <laughs> um, we can talk more about that later. Sorry, I'll try to move through. We have so many things going on. Um, so, the other thing we've been working on is is um, creating an official map during the zoning process. Um, priority conservation areas was. Um, Kind of a, it kind of hit a dead end during the zoning process. It wasn't appropriate for that um, to be implemented in the zoning. So the other option is something called an official map, which I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with. Um, not all communities in Vermont have it. Um, there are several that we're kind of basing our model off of. And we've been working with Parks Commission and other partners to find these priority areas to hopefully come up with a map that will essentially give the city um, right of first refusal for areas that our citizens feel are the highest priority for conservation areas. So um, that's... It's probably worth noting that in our goals setting um, time, the idea of having um, more park space and particularly um, park space south of the river was a priority. Is that a fair thing for me to say? It was raised. Okay. It was raised. Yeah. It was raised. Yeah. official map Great. was raised as a... As a Vehicle. Oh yeah, as a separate thing. Great. So, so yeah, we're looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, we've been working with closely with Mike Miller and um, and getting that going. Kind Great. Of, yeah. So that's um, another uh, another chunk of our our, uh, our momentum right now. Uh, we have another uh, recent victory. We officially partnered with the uh, Central Vermont Career Center's Natural Resources Course, and. Um, we were able to donate some money towards the tree planting that is going on in the region, but uh, we're, our money went towards trees that are being planted in, in the city limits. And we are actually going to start integrating them into the students in the fall into an education aspect of our partnership where they're going to help with their stormwater project that Paige just mentioned. As well as maybe some of the students from the high school. Correct. So this is a new partnership that we're um, really excited about, uh, and they're actually volunteer to help do maintenance, which is a which is usually a big issue with stormwater type infrastructure. Uh, they usually are really nice to begin with and then have issues later on, but we, that partnership should help you greatly with that. And in terms of education and outreach, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the the upcoming bio blitz that is happening inside the city limits on July 21st and 22nd. And the Conservation Commission has, is an official partner in that event with the North, North Branch Nature Center, and we have been working with that group to to get that that program going, and we're focusing on the ecology portion of the, the weekend, the events that are going on at the Nature Center. Um, and so we'll have volunteers there. We've been helping with fundraising, and we will, another big part of it is we've been asking for um, permissions and, and, and finding priority areas within the city limits that we hope to uh, inventory for um, natural communities, and we'll use this data to help up, update our information um, throughout. So this is definitely a, a, an awesome symbiotic relationship that um, that's going to be a pretty big deal. It's been ten years, and the last one was I think the biggest one in in the area. And there's there's been a lot since, but so we're really really excited about that, and we're gonna we've been heavily involved. Um, that's. That's kind of what's been going on this year, and then we've been we've been mapping out our our plans for the following years. Just um, 
storm. We have a, a couple more stormwater projects that are on, on the horizon. We we want to really boost our public outreach, and so we're looking into kind of getting materials. We came up with the one of our commissioners signed a logo for us, which we're really excited about. We could share with you. Um, Facebook page. Yes, we, our yes Facebook page, um, and then we're going to continue on. We want to update our vernal pool mapping, and then we also have monies that were set aside several years ago from excess funds from the commission's budget um, to update our wetlands map. And this has been something that's we've been a priority for a couple of years, and we hope to do it this season. Um, we do have an RFP going out, and so that money that's been kind of sitting aside for that we hope to to use that very soon um, and then we have a couple riparian buffer plantings in the, in the um, just throw in the mix but um, yeah we have a lot going on so <laughs> great I, I also want to mention our next meeting in June is also going to be at Harbor Park at the new shelter um, we work with Jeff Bear uh, to help complete the fencing around the vernal pool near the shelter to keep the dogs out of there, and so we're going to go and um, kind of check it out, hang out, do our, our meetings outside. Very good. Yeah, so everyone's welcome, 6 o'clock, uh, second Thursday, June. Yeah. Uh, questions? Yeah. Questions for the Conservation Commission? Um, so just as a heads up, um, I mean, I think it's very likely that we may be talking about a plastic bag ban. Um, yes. In the city sometime in the near future. I mean, we, we don't even know if we really can yet, but we'll probably talk about it. But um, it seems like an issue that I would at least want you to weigh in on to say that I assume I, I would guess what I know what you think about it. But, um, uh, but anyway, I just want to put that on your radar. Um, the other thing that's on my radar as well is... Um, uh, B City USA. Are you familiar with B City? Um, it's like being a bee friendly city. Oh, this yeah, is, yeah. Um, pollinator friendly city. This is something that's uh, on my radar of priorities. Is oh, low level priorities, but just things that I, I you know, that I think about and um, may be of interest to your group as well. Absolutely, yeah. And it's um, on our scale. Once again, pollinators are another. Uh, you know, very appropriate for our scale. So, yeah. um, you know, for urban plantings and stuff like that. So, cool. Yeah. Talking about um, the idea of trying to institute some sort of a city, city we have, I don't think this has come to you, but it's something that we've discussed, um, some sort of a ban on human rights uh, for city usage, and I don't know how that would work. For si I think we can limit ourselves as to what, that's what I mean. um, and I would love to talk more about that. Yeah, that's great. that's yeah, the kind of thing I think it's worth. Um, with it's within our jurisdiction and um, of course, and, yeah, and sometimes so. it's it's symbolic in some yeah. ways, but right. Right. at the same time, it's educational. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd be interested in what requirements you know, it, what it takes to become qualified as B City USA. Great. Yeah. yeah. Other comments or questions? Yeah, Rosie. Two quick ones. Um, one I had heard about um, your work on the. Um, Mamba trails, and I just wanted to say that I appreciated the, you know, trying to make it better and figuring out how to work with people proactively. I just really appreciate that approach from the, the uh, commission. Um, and uh, the other thing I just wanted to note was that um, any materials that you create, educational stuff, I'm trying to be really proactive about putting really good, helpful stuff on the city website. So okay. yeah. I would encourage you to uh, take advantage of that and share all that with the city manager's office to post on Great. And yeah, she, she's been so wonderful helping us kind of sort through a lot of this stuff. And yeah, it's been great. Great. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. For all Thanks, work. Thanks, everybody. Please do pass on our gratitude to the rest of the commission. Absolutely. All right, so uh, we're going to jump to the to the tree board. Uh, now, and then after that, we'll come back to the community services presentation. Do you have something for Jeff? I do. Okay. I'll keep you awake. Oh, that's right. I
<laughs> well, it was. <laughs> oh, really? Can you do it? I'll see. So I'm going to get up here. That was, you're trying yeah, to rename You're not trying to rename it, are they? No, no. Let's see. Uh, click on that. There we go. And then all you have to do is, I think you just, just go through these like that, right? Just the arrow down. You want me to do it? Yeah, no, can you do it full screen? If you go to that little projector screen on the bottom. Bottom, let's see. By the Zoom. I'm PC right. illiterate, so. Where are we now? You're super close. Right. Over here? This one? No? <laughs> nope, that one, where Ann's finger oh, okay. was. Oh, no, no, you're right. It's Wait, that yeah, that's it. Yeah, this is the big thing you want to make. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah. I think it's like this one. Right. Look up, there you if go. you look up where I'm pointing. There we go. That's it. i got to get the glasses back on for that. <laughs> that's it. There you go. Hey, all, right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So thanks for taking time to hear us tonight. I realize how busy a night it's been, and uh, we really appreciate a chance to update you on what we've been doing for the last six months to a year. Um, <clears throat> There we are appearing in front of City Hall with the new Tree City USA flag, which we were grateful to be able, able to hang for the month of, uh, of May. The tree board has been around since 1992. Uh, we are now a full nine member board uh, and we have about two dozen volunteers that uh, are available to us on a pretty regular basis. We meet monthly. You're always welcome to those meetings. They are one hour in length, period. <laughs> <laughs> and then, even more exciting, we have work days, usually two to three work days a month where you can get your hands dirty. Uh, you don't have to know a lot about trees to come on a work day. There's always something to do. Um, we do operate with about a $2,000 annual budget from the city, and we've learned to stretch that pretty far, I must say. This is a group of kids over on St. Paul Street that were involved in a project that one of our board members uh, set up to uh, plant more trees on St. Paul Street, and then enrolled, worked with the Union Elementary School kids to have them become tree stewards for those trees and other trees around town. It's a brilliant project. Okay. <clears throat> we had a big spring, uh, just, just wrapped up planting over 60 trees in the city. We buy our trees <clears throat> bare rooted from a specialty nursery out in the state of Oregon. And so they look like this. That's the pile of trees in the back of a pickup truck. It makes it really easy to transport them they're less expensive, they're much healthier than uh, typical ball and burlap trees that you'd see at a nursery. So we really have uh, planned to go this way in the future. And our basic goal is, is pretty simple. We want to be able to quickly influence the city streetscape by planting the right tree in the right place uh, and do that properly. So we don't hand out free trees. We're happy to plant a tree in somebody's yard, but we're going to talk about where it needs to be, which species it should be, and then talk to them about how to maintain that tree over time. <clears throat> what we found years ago by handing out free trees was that you end up with the wrong tree in the wrong place, and they're poorly maintained. So this year, uh, our focus was the Clarendon Terrace neighborhood pretty barren of trees, large trees. There's a couple of old remaining ones. And the other problem with Terrace Street in particular is that there's a, it's a high-speed uh, road. Uh, and what research shows is that if you plant trees, cars slow down. Don't try and figure out why. It's simply statistically proven. Uh, last year, we really focused on St. Paul Street. That was kind of our initial kickoff on a project. And uh, uh, over the last two years, Berry Street, and I'm excited to say that on Berry Street, you can really see those trees growing now after 
one to three years. They're popping up. There's 35 trees on that street that weren't there three years ago. And there's, we planted a few more this spring, and there's one more going in soon. Uh, but these are some of the uh, photos from this, uh, this spring earlier. Uh, that's the corner of Dairy Lane and Clare, uh, Terrace on the left, where you, a barren, absolutely barren corner. And there's now seven trees on that. Uh, and then on Ter uh, Clarendon Street, this, these neighbors were so excited to have us plant a couple of trees in their front yard. There are little leaf lindens, which are also a great pollinator tree. So we do buy the bare root. We uh, have a small nursery out at North Branch Nature Center. They've been gracious enough to house us out there. We do make a small donation to them most years. Uh, we're able to plant these trees in the nursery for one to two years, uh, the ones that we don't plant directly into neighborhoods. And then we can easily plant those out uh, after one or two years, pretty much any time throughout the summer because we plant them in bags big cloth bags that are easy to lift out and you can protect the roots in doing that. I will say that the nursery would be impossible for us to do just our own board without the help of the Parks Department. Uh, they've been so generous with their time and their equipment and expertise and it's a real partnership. They too uh, plant trees there that they're utilizing in the parks, uh, but we're all the time trading labor back and forth. One of the things we will need to consider at the nursery this summer, uh, and we don't have a solution for it yet, is uh, how to provide water to the trees. We're past hauling buckets of water out of the tr out of the river and dumping them on trees, but we'll figure that out. So the downtown trees are special, and that's really what enrolled me in the tree board uh, 25 years ago now. Uh, and downtown trees are, it's a tough challenge. The average life of a tree downtown is about seven years. Lots of different reasons. The main one being we never know what's under the ground and we're planting them in these very small areas. It's an impossible thing really. We finally are being honest about how impossible it is. We do come across some like uh, Fred Bashara's green ash there next to the theater is a beautiful tree in large part because of the species. We're not planting green ash anymore <laughs> and it's too bad nor Norway maples, both of which grow fabulously downtown, but we just have to figure out something else. What type is a little tree? Uh, it's a dead one. <laughs> <laughs> what species? I, I or don't died. remember. It, I'll tell you that we have replaced that tree probably five times in, in the last 20 years. It's it's on the shady side of the street for one yep. thing. Yep. Uh, I don't I don't pretend to understand what goes on in all of these. We do have to water the trees downtown. You may see people out watering 6 o'clock in the morning. There's uh, two or three of the volunteers and members that do that on a regular basis throughout the summer and fall. We also apply gypsum, which is a really simple compound uh, chemical uh, and compost to all of the trees in the early spring to counteract the salt, which is deadly to many trees. Uh, and we're continuing to look for species that do work. We're having good, good results with ginkgo, uh, and we planted some, but we don't want to get overcommitted. I mean, this elm tree is a, the last big elm tree in Montpelier on Court Street. If you haven't been over and hugged it lately, I would ask you to do that. <laughs> it's a beautiful tree, and I don't know that we'll ever get to a place where we can grow trees like that downtown, uh, but we're going to give it our best. I'm excited to report that last year DPW um, was, well, they were rebuilding sidewalks. You'll remember that, I'm sure. Uh, but I approached them as to whether they would help us renovate the planting wells. What I found was that they were tearing out sidewalks right around trees. And there's a simple procedure, relatively simple procedure, to excavate further out and down and put in what's called structural soil. 
It's a material that was developed at Cornell that allows the roots to grow out in under the sidewalk, but the sidewalk's still safely supported. Um, DPW is fabulous to do this. It was not inexpensive, but it was a pretty cheap fix given the results that we're, I think we're going to get out of it. We, we left the trees in place in six wells and yet created this whole area uh, and filled it with structural soil. Now the sidewalks are back in there. We basically, we more than quadrupled the size of the root zone for those trees. So we should see them t make a good hit of growth this summer. The guards and grates have been quite a problem uh, for us for a number of reasons. The, the main one is that even though they're made out of cast iron and well made, they don't last forever. And this sort of hit us blindside a couple of years ago when we realized there were a lot of them that had these holes broken into them. The grates and guards were broken. We experimented with some wooden, wooden guards that turned out to not work very well. The bottom line is we're going to need $10,000 worth of grates and guards. DPW knows this. I've talked to Bill about it as, as well. And I'm confident that we can come up with money both from city and elsewhere over the next couple of years to completely bring everything up to where it needs to be so that there aren't trip hazards like this and so that the trees are protected. I am really excited about this project. Tree City USA uh, is something that we've worked on uh, every year for almost 20 years. We are now 16 years in a row being honored by the Arbor Day Foundation as one of 3,400 cities in the country uh, that is designated Tree City. You have to have a board, an ordinance, spend on uh, at least $2 per person on trees uh, and celebrate Arbor Day. So here's, here we are, John sit, sitting with me and uh, Abby Callahan and a couple of the parks folks uh, planting an elm tree on Elm Street. <laughs> the only one that I know of that's been planted there uh, and one of the few that's growing. And as we did that, Abby read the proclamation for Arbor, Arbor Day. So we're now officially uh, Tree City USA for the 16th year in a row. And one of our board members uh, and, a, and a committee of board members took Home City uh, and, and was inspired to create Tree City. So for the month of May, we've declared ourselves Tree City. And uh, it wasn't, we didn't do a lot this year, but one of the things you may have seen around town are these fabulous posters. And uh, uh, one of the board members created these. There's uh, four different ones for ash, elm, and the emerald ash borer, ginkgo. and ginkgo, thank you. And uh, we, these are printed on heavy cardstock. We'll reuse these next year, and I'm going to guess we'll have another dozen next year, as well as a lot more educational events and uh, hoopla uh, for next year. So I'm pretty excited about this. It's a great initiative. Education is an important part of what we do. I know that we can do even more, but if we can talk to people about why it's, it's not appropriate to hang Christmas tree lights in a tree, it's no more appropriate to do that than you'd hang them on your kid, honestly, uh, or <laughs> volcano mulch, and we're still fighting some city entities around this, but that's a good way to kill a tree. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do to educate people for the proper way to do things. And then we avoid problems in the future. One of the tasks that we've taken on is to review anything that's tree related for DRB. And we've been able to catch stuff that was so simple to erase on paper or change on paper before it got planted that uh, I, I think this is probably one of our most valuable things that we've, we've done. So, the emerald ash borer. Should we talk about that? I guess. Because <laughs> we have to. Uh, it was first found in the United States in about the late 1990s. No, no, nobody's exactly sure 
but what we do know is it's spread like crazy. It's now east and west of the Mississippi River, and um, it's deadly. I'm from Michigan, the area where it was first discovered, and when I go back there every year, I just see the devastation that's been caused by this little tiny beetle. That's it sitting on a penny. It's not even the size of a penny, that little green thing above the world, word emerald. And uh, unfortunately, this last spring it was found 15 miles from here. It could well be in Montpelier already and we just don't know it. Um, John has headed up uh, creating an emerald ash borer uh, uh, plan so that we know how to deal with things when, when it does hit us hard. And part of that was an inventory. And so we inventoried the, the city and found 200 ash trees on city streets. 600 in Hubbard Park along the trails and roads and those are significant numbers because when an ash tree dies it becomes very brittle and quickly becomes a hazard from falling branches. So both of those 800 trees potentially are widow makers as we call them are going to hit somebody on the head. The, the other 2600 on private property there's some beautiful trees around the city on private property in fact Who's that guy up front in the blue shirt? Um, yeah, you got you got some huge trees on your property, Bill. Right next to your driveway. Yes. They are, they are, some of the biggest ones around. They are some of the biggest. We were impressed. How did you identify uh, the uh, location of the trees on private property? We did a, uh, a statistical uh, survey. Uh, basically, it took 99 properties at random from a list of all the properties in the city and visited those and surveyed them. And then we determined from there that 46% of the properties had at least one ash tree and we extrapolated out. And then we, could, we were able to extrapolate the numbers of trees. It's an estimate. But it's a good one. John did a lot of work on this thing and it really, I think we got a good handle on what's there. Uh, the one that really, you know, hits hard, although all, all of it's going to be a big problem, but the one that hits hard are the 10 downtown green ash trees. Because when they're gone, it's going to be a big hole. And they will be gone. 99% of untreated ash will be dead in the next 10 years. There will be a wave that comes through that takes most of those trees out uh, and many will become hazardous because they get so brittle. We spoke with uh, the council I think it was six years ago now and suggested that we start saving money because we're going to need to spend about $150,000 just on city trees that will need to be removed and on private property it's going to be you know, three quarters of a million dollars. And the benefit of removing them is we eliminate safety hazards and we slow the spread of the ash borer. Yep. It did say 99% of untreated? Yes. What does that mean? I mean, I mean, I know it means not treated, but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Is there treatment we can use? Can we come back to that in just a moment? Sure. Okay. So, what is next? Well, they're not all going to look like, again, this is the elm tree, but when, you, when I think back to my childhood and elm trees everywhere, you know, here we are with one in the city. So we need to plant more trees, bottom line, and at the same time diversify. Uh, so that's part of what we're doing right now. We need to care for the trees that we have. Uh, we work closely with homeowners to advise them on how to maintain trees, especially big trees, uh, and we work closely with the Parks Department, uh, which has the capability of uh, working on pruning uh, street, large street trees. Uh, and we need to upgrade the grace and guards. Next year we're going to have an even bigger tree city uh, festivity, and we'll continue to educate 
uh, the main thing that we're working on right now, and it's, uh, I can't believe how fast it's hit us, but it's to upgrade our preparedness plan, to implement our preparedness plan for EAB. And what we'll come back to you with this summer, right now we're researching what can be done, and we'll come back to you with uh, our research and suggestions. For the downtown trees, I believe it'll be a combination of we will cut some of the smaller trees that are not doing so well. Uh, we will um, make a suggestion, a recommendation that we add additional planting wells in the sidewalks downtown. That's going to cost money, but it's going to buffer us from the catastrophe that's coming. And we're considering what the possibilities are for using a pesticide. There are certain pesticides that seem to be, if not bee friendly, at least not bee enemies. Uh, there certainly are bee horrible pesticides we could apply. Uh, but there seem to be some that are being used in other cities very successfully uh, as part of a much larger approach to preserving specific trees. And uh, so we're, we're just at the initial stages of developing this plan, but we will be back midsummer to talk to you at much greater length specifically about that. So hopefully we'll have some good answers. Questions? Great information. Thank you. Let's let's uh, get the lights here. Great. Don't you think they're in shock? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is a shock. Um, I thought, you know, that, that this was going to be years off and it wouldn't come, and all of a sudden, wait a minute, this was a preparedness plan. We're not supposed to be implementing this, but here we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, fellas, how do you, how do you learn about the work days you do every month? Do you have a Facebook page? It's I can put you on an email list. Okay. You'll be notified. There's one rule. Uh -oh. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> You'll love it. No whining allowed. Yes. If you, if, do if you don't want to be there, don't come. If it is too hard, go home. You know, if you can't have fun and have fun with trees, don't don't worry. You know. I'll and, try. And that happens to all of us some days. You know, all of us say, I can't do it today. So we don't show up and somebody else does. But it's a lot of fun. And we schedule them ahead, but then sometimes cancel them at the end, and you would be notified. Could you put the council on the list? There's no whiners Absolutely. here. It's Absolutely. It's <laughs> good to know. Do you want to be on the list? I would, like I, I would love to be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody not want to be on the list? That's like pre-whining, isn't it? Well, and, and as a matter of fact, we will be mulching trees on Berry Street and the far, the east end of Stonecutter's Way tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock if anyone wants to come. Anybody want to like come? Yeah, I've got two uh, thoughts. One is same as was for the Conservation Commission. Um, Anything, any public documents you're creating and stuff, please. Go yeah, I wanted website. to mention that exactly. We uh, posted this onto our website. It's called the Homeowner's Guide to Emerald Ash Borer. It's an excellent little two page fact sheet, basically, as to what homeowners can do or be aware of uh, regarding ash on their property. So that's already been posted to our, our website along with our preparedness plan that's been there for several years now. Yeah. And we'll put the posters up, and that's one of our goals is to. Eight, we have a series of how do I plant a tree, how do I care for a tree, those sorts of things. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and then, nope, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, email you if I think of it. You are welcome to do that. Uh, it's gone. Uh, just a small question. I'm curious to hear what the, the most successful species are in sidewalk plantings so far. I know you said that it's difficult and there aren't any. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variabilities. Um, yeah. Sun and shade is a big one. Uh, we have a lot of problems along East State Street by City Center because that wall faces southwest and it just bakes summer and winter. 
to one side of the tree and the winter will be cold, the other side will be hot. I mean, it's, it's a challenge. Can you, can you rotate them? <laughs> <laughs> you can rotate them. <laughs> no whining allowed, though. <laughs> um, we're, we're doing honey locusts, lindens, the two. If you ha haven't noticed the two trees out in front of City Hall, they are spectacular trees. I worked on them yesterday. They're little leaf lindens, beautiful shape. They've got nice uh, space to grow in. In another two weeks, you will hear those bees when you walk by, those trees when you walk by, because they'll be full of honeybees. Full of honeybees. Uh, Rosa, do you have one? Do you um, work with DPW at all in terms of um, figuring out tree trimming? So, you know, they have to trim trees for science and that kind of thing. Are you engaged with that? They regularly ask us to do that kind of clearance work and we solicit from the public, uh, do, are there any areas where there's problems? Yeah, we work very closely and, and they're great because we can oftentimes do the pruning work, but we don't have the, may not have the capacity to take away the brush. Okay. So I just call them up and boom, it's gone. Great, good to yeah. know. Same way with the parks folks, they've been fabulous. Sorry, I just kind of go back to my day job. I'm a biologist at D-Train, so um, I'm the liaison for EAP and Emerald Ash for yep. day job. So uh, but one of the things that came up was uh, where to bring ash trees that are inside the quarantine zone. Thank you. And I was wondering if the city would be able to accept ash that was shipped nearby. I mean, is this something I'm starting the conversation with? But That's on our summer list, too, okay. is we're, we'll come back with a plan for Basically, a, uh, an area where we could stockpile process. and stockpile. Yeah. yeah. And there is, I know that B-Trans has areas to stockpile as well, but it would be great to partner to have the yep. ability to bring here. Yeah. We are in the buffer of the quarantine zone, so yep. it's one of the few places that you can move ash right now in the state. Anyway, just like that. Okay. Yeah, we'll great. We're Thanks. in the infestation area, so uh, contaminated ash can move throughout this area, and we're in that area. This is the, uh, I don't know if you're going to quickly pass that around. That we're already Super vulnerable bad. to ash, yeah. they can That's bring correct. us more? Well, that, because the, it's, <laughs> it's quite likely that the emerald ash borer is already here. You're we, just not noticing its damaging effects yet. We're in a very large quarantine area. They're still trying to ask people to not transport firewood. Out, outside of the, if you drive north or south of here, you'll run into B-Trans signs that say no ash leaving this area basically so we're in a zone that's already infested unfortunately was, for us i went, went to my mom's a few weeks ago in maine as soon as i crossed the border man big side no i sure. firewood a lot. oh yeah well it's interesting that you you know you see this little critter and you think oh this is a biological problem no 98 percent of the infestations in the last 20 years have been due to humans transporting these little bugs it's not the bugs. They can only go about three miles a year. And they can survive in firewood for a couple of years. So you get firewood from an infested area. They, look, they put it on your property. Before you burn it, if they're escaping during the summer, they're infesting your trees. And if you drive it to Maine, hey, they got a free ride. So it's really a people problem. I just it was one of those things I, you know, I noticed after hearing from yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Okay. Yep. I got you. And last but certainly not least, uh, the community services presentation. Thank you for your flexibility on that. Okay, I'm not sure if you want to stand a minute or if you, we should uh, use our sleep, uh, sleep learning uh, tone. Would you guys like a hard copy? I don't know soon, but you want one. I, I do. Oh, yeah. I can just pass it around and you can double click on it. Oh, presentation. Actually, we should probably put a link to on the main part of the sure situation. Even that. I bet it's that. I'm not it's here. Be. Thank you. Um, 
I don't know. I'm, but it's not up yet, so. Um, is there a trick to? Maybe it just hasn't read it yet. Sometimes it. Which one? The one that's out of the folder. In the bottom one, we had the wrong one. It's a projection. Is the projector off? No. <laughs> you could do something. so. <laughs> that doesn't work here. <laughs> Stay, get No, it just doesn't want to get rid of your nice picture. <laughs> Do you need to, I don't know, modify the projector reading on here? So I thought I could disconnect the projector. That's what we thought. Here, you try this. You know, I'm trouble my thing too. Right here. Well Always worth a try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I only I only do lots. Close down this PowerPoint. And the lights are coming on. Yeah, it's slow. Sorry, everybody. There we go. That should work. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, should we take a couple minutes? We might as well take yeah. a break. Yeah. Oh, we have some chocolate. Involved. Hardy's <laughs> <laughs> oh, eggs God, go looks, everywhere. <laughs> that looks familiar. Not those eggs, no. We got fresh. What's up? Try this. How do you usually do it? I have a, I have a PowerPoint on
five minutes. Perseverance uh, as well. Um, all right, this community services, the, the three uh, divisions now of Parks and Trees, Recreation, and the Senior Center who never represent community services. Um, the long term vision developed in 2016 that there would be eventually uh, community services would be uh, led by a single department head while maintaining publicly recognizable divisions. And part of that is that uh, each of our divisions have recognized um, that we have a number of uh, supporters and volunteers who um, really have um, bonded with the idea of uh, parks and senior center and, and rec. And community services is, um, is, a, is a great name, but it is also blend, has uh, suffers uh, abuse of many uh, definitions, uh, uh, including uh, some, uh, including people, high school students, including the, have do the community service, which uh, sometimes uh, willingly and sometimes not so willingly. Anyway, um, it, 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 <laughs> uh, but it's, um, so as we develop a, a relationship with community services, uh, create more possibilities. So we also envisioned improved programs, synergies, and facilities for residents while maintaining fiscal health an integration process that's adaptive, flexible, and based on regular evaluation of what's working well and prioritization of strengths of the current staff and the high value residents put on these programs and the vital role volunteers play in a community services department. Um, yeah, I guess you can't see the org chart, but I guess you'll get a, um, <coughs> you'll get a copy of this and if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer it. Yeah. Do, so, do you want us to say anything about the org chart, or do you have questions about how our staff were supervising, et cetera? I mean, we're also in transition. Uh, we've got a vacancy in our communications and development uh, due to Dan Grober going to Montpelier Alive. We're soon to hire that, but um, we've restructured that job a little bit and changed some supervisory roles. So. Continuing to make changes. Yeah. Okay. In the in the last year, we've uh, returned uh, 0 0.2 of a 0.5 position administrative support. Uh, uh, the, the cut of the half time position was in 2017. Um, another change is the recreation maintenance expanded at uh, 58 Berry Street facility, uh, and we have increased fundraising targets to meet our budget. And 58 is the senior center. 55 is the rec building. If I recall, Dan Grober was, maybe it wasn't just Dan, but remember he was going to be one of the people sort of in charge of helping to meet the targets for increased fundraising. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's part of the role that we're yes. looking to hire. Yes, it's a communications and development coordinator role. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan was in the new VISTA position, was also going to help. Okay. Yeah, that, that as well. So what, what are we doing in, in the parks and trees? With, with the parks, we're in charge of 16 miles of trails, seven acres of lawns, two miles of hilly gravel roads, which makes it extra challenging. Uh, we groom trails in the winter. We have a number of facilities, including the tower and picnic shelters. Um, we have di and diverse volunteer management and training responsibilities. And, and trees, we have tree hazard removal. Uh, we have uh, street trees, which is uh, close to 3,000 trees around street trees around the city. We uh, work with the tree board and do substantial amount of tree planting ourselves. Uh, we, uh, we, when possible, we do preventative pruning and uh, and then care of the trees that have been transplanted, and including helping work with uh, 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 tree, downtown trees. Uh, we work uh, help with the tree inventory. Uh, and the tree nursery, and we sell firewood to help meet the uh, budget. Uh, we have seasonal events, uh, ice on fire uh, in, in, in the winter, enchanted forest in the fall, and park palooza, and the bio blitz is a new uh, thing in the summer uh, that we'll hear a little bit more about. Uh, parks include Hubbard Park, North Branch River Park, Mill Pond Park, Blanchard, Summer Street, Turntable, Gateway, Peace Park. Stonewall Meadows Park, Elm Court, Girton Park, and Harrison Field. What's Harrison Field? Harrison Field is a on Harrison Ave. No? That's a that's a space over on Harrison Avenue. 
that if you, once you turn on Harrison Avenue, you go down maybe 100 feet or so, and on the right there's a space that I believe has kind of been, uh, there's an agreement with the city that we can manage it and we take care of the place and mow it. There's some planter boxes there, but a lot of the um, elementary school age and also the middle school kids will use, use that space for phys ed classes. Phys ed and also their eco program. To the list of parks on the website, please. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, trees. The trees, the importance of tree pruning. Uh, we're condensing a lot of information quickly here. Trees that aren't pruned early can cost very expensive problems uh, later and it means shortens the life of a tree because of the problems. This is, these are a couple examples of large trees that we um, had to uh, remove. And you can see where the two code, if you, if you don't have a, a dominant stem, then you have two leaders that have the same hormones and they both reach to be high and straight up. If you have one leader, the branches kind of are naturally submissive and they branch down and you don't get this problem where you get include what's called included bark with two stems reaching up at the same time. And this is a common problem on, on the unpruned trees and why this happens in nature nature doesn't mind if a branch breaks off and then there's a hole in the tree uh, owls and all kinds of birds love these cavities the, the damaged trees create all kinds of possibilities in the downtown area it's a hazard to humans um, so that's why we care about the trees uh, having uh, good health and then living to uh, a beautiful old age so these are two examples where a tree was dying and, and they often break uh, because the included bark reduces the strength by um, anywhere from 40 to 80 percent and then a wind comes and then it ends up uh, falling down and you may or may not see this unless you are trained to look at the uh, weak what's called a weak union so uh, yeah so pruning early uh, <coughs> pruning early uh, <coughs> it fills the cl classic thing of an ounce of a prevention is uh, worth a pound of cure. Uh, these are a couple of examples. That's a bad union on the left. It's very it's obvious. You can see all these stems growing up. Because in, in nature, trees are used to growing in a forest and they have to be competitive. They have to all grow, they have to get up and get the light because of all those seeds that a tree puts out, very few ever survive. And the only way you survive is if you grow a lot of branches fast and you shade everybody else out. So when you do that, you have a lot of bad unions often but at least you survive which a bad unions is better than surviving so we've got to prune if we don't want to have early problems and to the left is co-dominant stems that someone has uh, done quite a creative job of um, cabling um, but there's quite a and it's it's a lot more expensive and dangerous when a tree is cabled to remove it uh, safely yeah, much more expensive yeah. and again you get the short much shorter life of the tree Tree Board's an enormous partner in our, the health of our street trees. And uh, I like Thomas Fuller's uh, quote, uh, he who plants trees loves others besides himself. And this is certainly true of Tree Board members. And the new BioBlitz uh, this summer uh, is uh, in combination with a, a music festival we did last year. And it's a great collaboration with the Nature Center uh, where it's a really exciting thing. I can't tell you how amazing it is to see these scientists who volunteer and they come from all over and you, you see a bunch of scientists going out and they're, they're uh, collecting macroinvertebrates in the river and you see others that are going off and collecting butterflies and others birds and others reptiles and herp herpetologists and they come back and they all share and they're all excited sharing all the things they find and then they help us know what we have that is special and where it's special in Montpelier. And families and kids and budding scientists come and see this incredible knowledge and excitement and learn stuff. It's really an amazing uh, community building uh, uh, opportunity. And we're going to uh, sprinkle that with uh, music and, and the camping in the park and uh, celebrating outside with musically and with what we have here. Has everyone seen the new tuning fork stage yet that went up last summer? Oh, I encourage you to check it out. It's really awesome. Down in the field, down below the old shelter, uh, just you know, create some fun new possibilities. And a new rentable pavilion. Right. Yeah. Okay.
Um, things that we're doing with uh, in recreation, um, youth sports, youth and adult programs. We're also, for those of you who may not know, we're a licensed child care for both our summer and vacation camps. Our summer camp is much larger than our vacation camps. We Last year we averaged almost 108 kids a day. It was a big jump from the previous year because we're at 72 a day. So it was uh, it was quite a jump. So we had to make some quick adjustments to accommodate the uh, increased enrollment. Uh, events that we do, the parent-child dance, the egg hunt, for those of you who've been up in Hubbard Park, there's probably close to 800 people up there. It's quite an event. Uh, touch a truck we just did last week, which was uh, a nice successful event. Uh, special, we also do many pool special events throughout the summer. And then of course, for those of you who've been around for a while, our ski and skate sale that we do every fall, which draws probably close to a thousand people or better. Facility maintenance, uh, we continue to, do, to have multiple facilities with 55 Berry Street, Dog River Fields, Recreation Fields, Skateboard Park, Basketball Courts, Pavilion. I don't know how many people have been to the Pavilion uh, down by the pool. Uh, that's one of my first big projects I, I got to work on when I took over as director, and, and it's where we, ho we host our licensed summer child uh, daycare. So it's really a, a great addition to being in dirt and mud <laughs> to keep the kids out of that. Um, the pool house, of course, ball fields, tennis courts, mountaineers, field, and grandstand. And many of you know that they completed the accessible piece right in front. I was down looking at that the other day, and it, it came out pretty nice. And of course, now we've taken over the 58 Berry Street facility for from November to mid-April, basically, with our maintenance staff, with uh, doing the snow plowing, salted, and building maintenance. Um, so that's been been an adjustment. But once we get to April, it's everything takes off so much outside. We had to make some adjustments for the indoor cleaning. And this is some of our facilities. I unfortunately some of the pictures didn't. I would have liked them a lot better, but I was using a phone and not a camera. <laughs> but that's the, the Mountaineers, where the Mountaineers play on the big diamond to the left. This is a project that we've have been working with for the last few years with the ice rink on the state capitol, uh, which has been going pretty well. But we're definitely going to make some adjustments on how we set it up next year because this year we had a couple issues with it losing some water. And this is our freshly painted pool that we just painted about a week ago, a week and a half ago. So we're getting ready to fill it here in the very near future. And I'll say a few words about the Senior Activity Center. So um, we've got lots of programs, and many of our programs happen on a weekly basis. Um, they promote healthy aging, and that happens um, through lifelong learning. We have lots of fitness classes, about 40 a week different fitness classes. Um, as well as art and technology and writing and so forth. There are many drop-in groups that are free and don't require advanced registration. Lots of cultural events, um, including concerts, film events, etc. cetera. Um, our Feast Senior Meal Program is really vital to many um, at-risk nutri for nutrition um, issues, older adults. And we serve about 18,000 senior meals a year, with about two-thirds of those going out as Meals on Wheels to residents of Montpelier and Berlin. Um, the Senior Center programming also provides really vital socialization, um, lots of volunteerism, and we host many partner services, um, including health clinics like foot care, blood pressure clinics, fruit clinics, and so forth. And we do we host blood drives and other many other things. Um, weekly events include many educational lectures, and like tomorrow we have a real estate agent who's going to talk about the the basics of. You know, if you want to sell your house, what what should you know? We've got someone coming um, in a couple of weeks that's going to be a United States Air Force clarinet quartet to perform. So it's really ranges very wide, the different topics that we present. Um, and we do special events throughout the year, like our other divisions. So they include an April rummage sale, um, which brings in about $5,000 and helps everybody with their spring cleaning. Um, we do the senior prom this year. It's on June 29th. Save the date. Friday night, 7 o'clock at the Capitol Plaza. The theme this year is Disco Fever. Yes. <laughs> As for what you want to wear, you know, if you want to dress in your 70s best, that's great, but anything goes. 
And it's for all ages. Plenty. And Had enough for everybody to and wear. Then, all right. <laughs> Plenty. You want to help with decorating? Oh my gosh, yes. We'll be just back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fred Wilbur, once again, is going to be the DJ. He knows how to help everyone have a good time. And, and other music requests can be made as well. There's always some Michael Jackson and other good stuff. Um, so then we do a volunteer recognition luncheon in December and many more events. Um, we were pleased this year to finally host one of the Green Mountain Film Festival events. We've hosted many city events um, and look forward to doing more. Um, and I'll just mention, I didn't put anything up here, but another thing that we do is we have a membership and we're close to 1,200 members now. They are 50 and up from all towns, about two-thirds from Montpelier, the other third from outside. <coughs> and um, membership has some benefits. It allows them to sign up for all of our classes. Some are open to the public, but some are for members only. They also get some free photocopying, access to our computer lab, some discounts at area fitness um, gym. So there are several great benefits. And the membership has just about doubled in the last five to six years. Um, and the trend that we're also seeing with our membership is that more people from our supporting towns are joining as members. So they make up uh, a quarter of our members now are from our six supporting towns, which are the U32 school district and Moortown. So we do um, put energy into petitioning and going to town meeting and making those requests each year. So our main facility, our headquarters, is at 58 Berry Street. And most of you had a tour. If you missed the tour, I'd be happy to do it again. Um, we also do programming at a lot of off-site locations, and there's a couple different reasons we do that. One, we're already busting out of the seams of our facility. We moved in six years ago after the renovation, post-fire, um, and there's such high programming demand that there are things that people would like to have more of, and, and we simply don't have space. So that has led us to go off-site, but we found that the extra benefit of that is being a center without walls um, attracts some people who would not otherwise go to a senior center. Um, you know, there are many, many people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s who just say, I don't want to go to a senior center. I'm not a senior. Uh, other people turn 50 and they're racing in to join, but there's, there's still some stigma about becoming older. And so, therefore, we find it really effective to do some of our programs off-site. And we're also trying to meet the needs of some of our supporting town members that contribute. So we've got classes at the town hall in Middlesex and Worcester. Um, we're doing a class at the hospital in Berlin again this summer. And we do some programming at Person Fitness, including lap swimming and water aerobics. And uh, we do some programs at the Montpelier Public Schools, including a really exciting um, intergenerational technology training project where seventh and eighth graders train older adults one-on-one, -on -one. and they've been focusing mostly on Google services. So Don Taylor, a teacher there, has helped organize that. And we do classes in some downtown businesses. We did a down-home kitchen last fall. We've done North Branch um, Cafe and others. And we do have some benefits in Barry at Rehab Gym. You want to go forward? So our um, facility is home to a lot of our programming as well as the community services main office. So my office as well as our office manager Norma and administrative assistant um, Harry, we are all in the front of the building. The back of the building um, is another office for our feast program staff and um, we have lots of interaction with our other community services staff with meetings that happen in our facility as well as across the street. And as most of you saw, there's also Montpelier Housing Authority apartments upstairs. So we share the building in a condominium association. Uh, so just a few photos of some typical um, Senior Activity Center activities. The one on the left uh, is actually from last week. Nancy Schultz and others went biking to look at the flowers blooming up on the Burlington bike path. Um, the one on the right is Ellie Hayes leading a Tai Chi demonstration for some elementary students um, who came around Chinese New Year. And the middle one is some women doing the hand building and clay class. So about half of our programs are in movement um, and we have a separate room for our art classes. We've got about 30 different trips planned for this summer. About half of those use our 12 passenger van that we lease from GMTA. 
It's wheelchair equipped, um, and the trips are very popular in the summer. And we also share our van with some other senior centers as well as Heaton Woods. Um, and I included a little testimonial from one of our longtime members, Amalia. Go ahead. Um, I said a few things about Feast. Just wanted to give you a couple images. Uh, you can see there's about 60 folks who come on a typical Tuesday to have lunch together. So it's not only the, the nutritious meal that always has lots of fresh produce, but it's the socialization that people get. Um, a lot of older adults are at risk for depression and isolation, and so the ability to come in and have a meal together is really important for many, many people. Um, on the right is a volunteer who's getting ready to deliver a meal to someone upstairs. Um, most of our meal delivery happens through volunteer drivers that use their own cars. I'll let you pick it back up, Jeff. All right. How do community services uh, contribute to achieving the council's strategic outcomes? Um, well, public health and safety, our wellness programs and well-maintained facilities encourage mental, physical, and emotional health, as well as do community building. Uh, for the goal of responsible and responsive government, we, we provide affordable programs. Uh, and free programs and facilities, diverse funding to reduce tax burden, diverse funding to reduce tax burden, strategic engagement of volunteers that allows for opportunities for them, not only them, but allows us to provide diverse, high quality programming at an affordable rate. Inclusive, equitable, and welcoming community uh, goal. Uh, again, we provide affordable and free programs, uh, financial aid, high customer satisfaction, professional staff dedicated to community services, many community partnerships, and important relationships with local, public, and private schools. And environmental stewardship. Uh, we uh, provided pesticide, pesticide free facilities, uh, 58 Berry Street Platinum Certified Renewable Energy for Heating Facility, reusable meals on wheels, containers, trash tramps, volunteer group headquarters, an initiative, uh, parks and green space that are kept available for public access, including 400 acres of parks and 30 acres of athletic fields. I realize I left out the word leads, that platinum certified. Yeah. yeah. I want to say this platinum is quick editing who? that you've got our goals in here. This is like, yeah. this is amazing. This is my favorite part right here. I'm like, yes. you're just really uh -huh. showing off. The, the benefit of being with you guys last night. <laughs> you were able to tweet. Uh, some of the challenges we face, uh, some three, uh, some key ones. Increased demand and need for services puts a strain on current staffing level. The emer emerald ash borer it will cause substantially more tree removal work. Older adult programming demand grows with population expansion. Customer service needs growing across all divisions and uh, recreation maintenance staff juggling indoor space fields and more. Regarding facilities, uh, rec facility issues, uh, senior center programs, outgrowing available space, substantial number of neighborhoods not yet in walkable distance to a park. Merging issues, uh, uh, recreation community feasibility study, continued integration of the community services staff and potential partnership with Jump and Splash, uh, creating additional park options, potential VISTA with positive youth development to help prevent substance and opioid abuse. For discussion this year, we want to study the potential impact on community health and economic development via a walkable, affordable community recreation center for all ages. Uh, we want to explore the regionalism and diverse funding for community services and recreation facilities. We want to face the Emerald Ashbor uh, challenge ahead of us. Uh, we want to be an aging friendly community and continue to strengthen volunteer management systems across the city service delivery areas. We want to continue to build on our fundraising success. Our priorities are to continue to integrate community services, department functions, and staff, meet demands for affordable, health-enhancing, meaningful programming throughout the community, and provide diverse facilities that meet community recreational health and lifelong learning needs. We want to improve our substance abuse prevention efforts, which really is tied closely to uh, improving community uh, health. Um, there. Uh, 
project hand in hand and collaborate with council residents and partners together community input and formulate a plan to meet present and future community recreational needs uh, so uh, this kind of is maybe not quite in order but every park to as a, as a peace place of peace and I just want to add a, um, a thing uh, a last thing about um, uh, the, the kind of a summary and that uh, you know we, we've talked about programming uh, today the importance of the diverse programming uh, we want to talk about um, the uh, facilities and then uh, we've talked about uh, volunteers but volunteers um, really are um, not just uh, saving taxpayers money but it really is a program in and of itself uh, as a, a volunteer myself uh, I know the amount of, of pride I feel that knowing that I make a difference to the community and I see that in the number of the volunteers that, that come and in fact even farther than that uh, a number of wounded individuals come and uh, it is really transformative I don't think you can measure the impact it has to see a kid who feels like they are a drain on the community and a drain on their parents and they find out that they can be uh, they can help build the community and, and help take care of a place that they love and, and the pride that grows in their face I've literally had uh, community kids come angry about doing community service and, and then asking to come back after they're done uh, to do more and it's just a uh, um, it's, uh, it's a really win-win situation yeah. I'm just going to offer one all. more yeah. anecdote on yeah. that along those um, lines that I've, I've heard from another, a number of people that coming together to volunteer in the kitchen to prepare meals five days a week. And, and many people come several days a week. Some come just once for a couple hours. But I've heard them talk about kitchen therapy, just that act of chopping vegetables and, you know, adding garlic together. Um, they're, 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 they're meeting people, they're engaging, they're doing something that really makes a difference to the people. And nurturing we, others. Nurturing, nurturing others, others, and yeah. it's, it's just, it, it is transformative for a lot of people. We've been really fortunate to have a fabulous VISTA member with us this year, Becky Johnston. If you haven't met her yet, I'd encourage you to reach out. She's been developing some new volunteer management and recruitment and recognition systems for us, as well as, well as helping with some of our fundraising efforts. Bless you for your community service. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And one thing we didn't have an opportunity to do yet, which I would invite you all to do, is to do an exploration of our outdoor facilities. And we can do a tour sometime when it works out. Jamie can help us set up a time. We can take you around and see all the other stuff, because you saw just our two buildings. So, and let me know that she hasn't been in the pool house. Yeah. Got to get I her. Got to do a tour of the it's pool house. A cultural experience. <laughs> it's purple inside. <laughs> I love the purple paint. Right, yes, Rosie. So I do have one issue I want to flag, um, and I have to say I'm a little bit frustrated about this. Um, I had contacted city staff back last July, asking that the listing of parks on the city website get updated, and I continued to ask about it. Um, and I understand that after the mayor asked about it recently, um, Jamie got frustrated and just went ahead and found the information herself and started updating it. So the, the website is much better than it was in terms of listing the parks. But on your list of parks here, I noticed three more that are not on there, one of which I didn't even know about. Um, and these parks don't necessarily exist to a lot of our community if they can't find out about them online. And that became very clear when um, we were asked to sign a letter of support for a, another park's grant. Um, and I was surprised to see it citing a Trust for Public Land map saying that many people in Montpelier were not within a 10 minute walk of a park. And I know there are, there are certainly portions of Montpelier where that's true, and I want to fix that. But I looked at the map, and a lot of those parts of Montpelier that they were saying weren't next to a park were next to existing city parks that just were not mapped. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we spend all our money to create these wonderful community resources, and it's, it's unfair to the residents who don't know about them if we don't advertise them. Um, and it's just a waste of our money if we don't make it apparent to people. So um, the council has now made a priority that we want to have our website updated to reflect the resources that we have, and I just want to stress to you I find that really, really important, and I'm I'm pretty disappointed that it hasn't happened, frankly, um, given you know it's been almost a year, um, 
<laughs> I'm, uh, I'm uh, sorry it hasn't had it completely. I, I'm not aware of Jamie doing any, but I, I did update uh, a number of the parks uh, on, on the website. Um, and I am going to do more. There's uh, some that I don't have access to, uh, like the Turntable Park. Uh, I provided access to. That was totally done by the Planning Commission. But I will do what I can. I promise you it isn't because I haven't worked extra hours. And I, <laughs> if there's a lot of priorities and a lot of trees. Uh, and I am doing the best I can. But I, I do agree that it's an important goal and that uh, I will continue to work towards that. Yeah. And, and I've just taken notes so that we as a team can figure out maybe there's someone to help. Update that. Yeah. 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 We'll like that up. We're happy to do it if we just have the, the list. Okay. We could send more. Yeah. yeah. Get more. Just yeah. She'd ask for a list from Parks folks. And, uh, I don't. I, I never was asked for a list, but I, I was asked to update it, and I I, I started on that. And if, if she just wants a coach, she just <laughs> if she wants if she wants a list. I, I will get her that list. I can just give the list I gave you. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. And with us um, hiring a new communications person soon, um, we'll, I'm sure we'll be having lots of other website updates. And certainly if there's other things missing or that you notice you'd like to um, have in greater detail or anything, we welcome your input. Continuous revolution. Yeah. Yes. I've got a couple of questions. One is um, sort of thinking about the parks, especially uh, going into the future um, and you know that we talked about there is support for expanding parks yes. in Montpelier and the question that I think about is do you have the staffing and other research if if we were to expand the footprint of the park put in more parks or whatever would you have the staffing and resources in your, at your current staffing levels to manage it or is should we be planning for uh, expansions in that area to, uh, um, to support it? So it depends. Um, it depends on uh, the interest and goals of the council and the residents. Uh, for example, um, we have done uh, we've done a substantial amount to do the parks. And in, in fact, having a great need actually, I think, inspires more volunteers. Um, but it also requires patience on uh, when you do that it requires patience on some folks when you don't mow milk on park because it, it rained and you're short of volunteers and your staff is out sick and you can't update a web page and if, if things need to be done in a certain timeline then we're going to need more staff if there's patience on folks about what's done and when then we can we can do more so it depends on the quality and the quickness of service that's needed. That would be my short answer, is how much more we can handle or not. Other comments? Yes. I just wanted to let you all know, I really appreciate that you sort of looked at what we had identified as goals and fit in what you're currently doing and kind of gave us some areas that you've already flagged as areas where you need some guidance or some assistance. Um, and that's incredibly helpful to me when things are like structured and organized and I can see where where we can kind of help fill gaps or where you all are looking for support from us, maybe your guidance. So I really, I really appreciated that. Thanks for your feedback. I have, oh, yes, Jeff. Just a observation. When one of my sons was in school here, he, uh, he did a day, I don't know if you remember, uh, doing Thank you trees on the riverbank. Yeah, doing community-based <laughs> learning uh, with you one day, and he came back and he had to write a report for school, and I think the first line of his report was, Jeff Byer should be worshipped as a god. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, make my day, Jack. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> he was a big help. He was, he was a big help. He, he's still working in trees, and he's uh, oh, sweet. Probably moving back to Montpelier this summer. So, okay. oh, you yeah. want to volunteer? Send my best wishes. Um, so I have, um, oh, unless you have, okay, I I have a somewhat of a not fully formed thought. That, um, so bear with me here. Um, so this is mostly for Arnie and Jana. I'm you know thinking about 
uh, the community services in terms of like what the program is programming is that we're offering um, to people. So especially coming from where um, you, you know you both started right with in separate departments, you know there's a focus on seniors, and I think mostly there's a focus on kids in the rec, um, you know, department, with some exceptions, you know, there's basketball, and there's, you know, dodgeball, kids play dodgeball, it's good times, um, you know, there's, there's a variety of, of things there, um, and in fact, I am a, a subcontractor um, with the rec department, and in that I offer uh, Ultimate Frisbee as a camp, um, when I, when I think about the types of offerings that, um, that come through the, the community services department, some of the things feel really important in that they are providing a public, like, a, I mean, everything's a public good to a degree, right? But some of the things I think are, um, addressing public health issues, uh, perhaps more directly, People are probably going to be fine if they don't play ultimate, right? Like, but people really should probably know how to swim, or you know, doing you know the bone builders uh, activity for the seniors, right? There, maybe I'm making a false, drawing a false line here in terms of what's public health and what's not necessarily. But I guess what uh, where I'm going with this thought is that um, I I wonder about the kinds of public good. Um, that can be offered through a community services department that maybe we're not offering right now. Um, so, and by virtue of that, you know, we're coming from two different perspectives, right? We're coming from what do seniors need, and then what do, you know, uh, kids need, and then, you know, adults in terms of recreation. Um, but I feel like there may be some gaps, in, and I, I guess what I'm thinking of is like, um, you know, what do what do new mothers need, right? Or like, what, like, should, I, maybe we offer like babysitting training or something, but. Um, we do. We, we do offer that, okay, great. <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking about like, the, like how, how about the services that adults need that are maybe not seniors uh, that are, that would constitute a public good. Um, so and just to finish this, thought, um, you know, there's a reason why we, I, why in the end, like, we do ask for some taxpayer subsidy for these programs, right? Like, it's not all toll booths on roads, right? Like, if you use it, you will pay. I mean, we, we do ask for some contribution, but it, it is also subsidized by taxpayers. Am I, am I correct on that? Well. Or some, somewhat? Some are. Yeah. Some <laughs> to, are, To some a certain extent. I will say that for the Senior Center budget, Less than a less than a quarter yeah. comes from the tax appropriation, right. um, and le and that doesn't cover just staff, right. um, wages and benefits. Well, I and so. I I know this is contrary to perhaps previous councils, but you know I I think about a class like you know learning to swim or bone builders, um, and I mean maybe there's a sliding scale of you know what people can pay, but I I really want those kinds of activities to be accessible to all people. Um, anyway, that's that's something that I'm thinking about, and I'm obviously I'm just one voice in that, and I, I do appreciate that we ask people to pay for, um, for things, at least somewhat. Um, but just, I, I guess I wanna spend some time thinking about what are the, what are the needs in our community. And I, I so Bill and I had talked a little bit a while ago about, um, you know, the needs of parents in terms of, you know, is there affordable childcare that's available up till five o'clock? And I think, you know, from our conversation, it sounded like there was. Um, and I'm very grateful uh, for that. But those are the kinds of questions that I want this group to be asking. Um, and and I, I guess I even want to picture the work that you do on this continuum of age uh, like what what are the yeah we offer all these great programs that are open to any age awesome but we know we're going to target um, the needs of specific age groups um, 
or types of folks, you know, people who are new parents or whatever that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, see if there's gaps. We do offer, uh, just so you know, uh, and it's free to the to the public for uh, uh, preschool play program mm -hmm. every Wednesday morning for a couple hours, and we have anywhere from forty to sixty folks that come through, and a lot of them find it very valuable because it gets their kids out of the house and intermingle with other kids, and so we do we do do some things like that, but there's many play groups in the city, so we try sure. to fill a spot where there wasn't. Sure. Well, that's good to know. I mean. I mean, my immediate question was, well, why is it just Wednesdays? I mean, clearly there's, there's probably details and reasons why it's just Pickleball. Wednesdays. Well, What's that? <laughs> Pickleball, that's it's why. Actually, yeah. It's actually not. What, there's several play groups around the area, and what we did was found a day that they didn't have one, yeah. so we plugged yeah, in. Yeah, fair enough. Plugged in the day. And, and a short, a short answer to it could be a long, long thing. I mean, part of, they do, do County does do scholarships, but another thing that we just talked about today that fits, I think, beautifully into your question is we want to work with the council and the community to identify gaps as part of this feasibility study. Because even if we don't do the recreation center, we want it, we think by just adding a few key questions, we can find out where some of those gaps are and where some of those needs that might not it might not be a community center. It might be other ways that we can fill these recreation needs in the city. So we'd like to have that. Like that. I guess I almost want to, wanna, yeah, I agree. I, I, I almost want, like recreation is a need, you know, I want to acknowledge that, but I think there are some public health issues that can be addressed by the community services, you know, department, um, that are not recreation. And, and, you know, I mean, I guess we might think of where, where else would you address public health? I mean, if it's opioids, it'll probably be through, you know, the, the police. But but there's plenty of public health that is not, you know, drug related. So um, how can we be preemptively, you know, equipping people or uh, addressing those health needs? I would love to see, um, and we talked about this a little bit when we were in the uh, senior center tour, but I would love to see um, us develop additional nutrition programming. Um, we did just finish a three workshop series about nutrition uh, nutrition from different parts of the world. So Lisa Maze led that and we've done some other cooking classes but I think that is one um, yeah. slightly Jean. untapped yep. possibility. Jean. There's been some spot special health needs that we've been trying to develop programming for. We've done, we, we do a couple of classes for people with Parkinson's disease. We do the Memory Cafe for people with um, memory disorders. This summer, one of our yoga instructors is going to be offering a class specifically for people with osteoporosis and osteopenia, which mm -hmm. is a really right. high incidence. Um, and another class for adults of all ages with lower back issues. And that we're scheduling that in the lunch hour so that Great. people might have a fighting chance of coming and taking that really inexpensive class. Do, do you do any financial literacy? We do, yeah. In at fact, the senior we've center? Got a, we've got a 10-week class in that going on right now. We're actually, it's in the evening at the high school, okay. but it's registered through us. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's been suggested, I was thinking about what we were talking about tomorrow too, but we talked to Yvonne because I know they do parenting classes and they have the you know, Justice Center. Mm -hmm. They'll be here yeah. next time. They have a lot of that stuff too, and they deal with a lot of families in crisis. Yeah. And so they develop a lot of services to try to, preventive services. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, Yvonne's also done some really great insights into conflict classes mm -hmm. to help people have those difficult conversations more effectively. Okay, yeah. cool. I just wanted you yeah, to know. Yeah, I, I really welcome further thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to sort of sit with that idea uh, for a little while. And along those lines, I think we've been creating many more intergenerational programs and there's a lot more potential for that as we go forward. And, I, and I'll just mentioned that I've been um, really enjoying a unicycle class with my son and there are also 70 plus year olds in the class so we've got 11 40 something and 70 something taking a class <laughs> together it's it's been really fun yeah yeah in the gym sounds great awesome well thank you all for your work and um, you this thank opportunity you all for your time and interest and Staying up late to talk with yeah, us uh, yeah. again. I didn't see anybody with their eyes closed. <laughs>
Thank you. So just one last um, reminder. June 29 is the senior prom. Disco Fever, 7 to 10.30. Facebook event. That Have we created a Facebook event? I think it's imminent. Okay. I, I was going to say, I haven't seen it yet. Done it. We're finalizing the flyer. Okay. We're a little behind eight ball without Dan Groberg. Uh, but we're, we're going to catch up. It's been mentioned in your newsletter. We haven't yeah. mentioned it in the newsletter. We just don't have our snazzy marketing stuff quite out there yet. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Oh, right. Summer schedule. Thank you. Oh, yes, um, yes. We have often reduced our work during the summer. It's been a good time to ask you guys after three straight nights. Our, uh, our normal meetings would be July 11, July 25, August 8, and August 22. So we have sometimes just dropped one. Sometimes we've them to try to have them, you know, more spaced out, or other times we've just said they'll be let's just leave that week there. Um, sometimes we haven't, we haven't been able to. Sometimes we say let's drop it unless we have to do something urgent, or we've actually had someone we just done a quick phone in meeting to approve a consent agenda, or, you know, business. Um, but we haven't actually had to do it in forty weeks. Um, so it's entirely up to you. Um, but I thought I'd raise it since it's May and we plan our agendas out. And now that we've you know, got a list of work from you folks, we've got to start about how we can I would love to drop August 8th. So, so just as an FYI, I am going to be gone July 9th through the 27th, so I will not be here for the 11th or the 25th. I'm gone the 25th. I'm gone the 11th. Maybe we should get rid of one of those. <laughs> sorry to... I'm probably going to eight. I apologize. But, sorry. Uh, Jack. So that's three of us, Mayor, Jack, and I, who will all be gone on July 11th. Ashley, are you gone at all? <laughs> okay. Let's so, all go away. So no July 11th meeting then? Yeah. July 11th is dropped. Okay. Uh, which might mean, uh, in my absence, Ashley, you might get to leave 25th. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 25th, I'm And Anne gets appointed to all the committees. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anne will be on every committee. Oh, yeah, too. but when she comes back, watch out. <laughs> you're taking no prisoners. Oh, dear. Yeah, you know me. Okay. I know what the class you're going to know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, are we we're gonna we're we doing so any guess, others? We're just doing one. Sure, let's we'll drop two. No. <laughs> <laughs> I probably will not be here on August eighth. Oh. But we all have to see like soon, unless you. I'll just, I'm that would have. I might want to not. I might not. Okay. <laughs> we could try to drop two and just do one a month in July and August. But if we can get away with it. As, as long as people don't mind the occasional call in meeting range hastily. I'm wondering though, um, I know we tried this experiment with starting at seven o'clock, but this we haven't gotten out before ten o'clock any of these meetings and I'm wondering if we have to go back to six thirty. I just think it's gonna be I mean, but you, I feel like actually you're the one that was the tightest schedule. Well, I work much closer now. Seven is seven is nice, but the ten thirty is Yeah. 6.30? Yeah, 6.30. Starting next time? Yeah, or? Starting next time. Okay. Yeah. I know, because next time we've already oh, warned is 6.15. Right, That's right. Oh, yeah. Okay, so time after that. So that would be June 27th? July 25th. No, June 27th. 6.30. 6.30. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I just fixed the website. <laughs> 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 ah, now, now, do we keep the eighth or let, let it go? I'm just. Uh, August eighth. That's a good question. August eighth. How many of you said it was an issue? I'll be here, but it'll just be a pain. Oh, Glenn, what would have been my grandfather's birthday? No, I'll be here. Birthday, the day after, so I'd like to spend some time with my family. Um. Well, why don't we 
Why don't we drop it and then see if we... It's not in July 25, I guess. If we do. We're going to be so efficient starting at 6.30. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, why don't we cancel it? And then if we need it, then let's put that one on a reserve for like... Well, I think what's, what's often important when we do these in the summer is actually, because we all got stuff that tend to come up too. And um, particularly after we've just done our work plans, we usually get a lot of things going. That's helpful for us. Not beating and adding. Because um, there's all well, this work going on. Other there. steps. But there are often like contracts and bids mm -hmm. and those types of things that do need to move. And I think that's it's usually for, for DPW and the departments that just want to know when to, to plan to have them. And as long as they know that if they still have one, we can take we it could up. have a consent agenda only meeting, which you are allowed to legally call in. Do that. It could be at five o'clock or five thirty or something like that, just to get business done. Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing. It's, you know, presentations and all that stuff that we are copying up and stuff. And just so you know, my list of mayoral things to do uh, I'm going to be hopefully hitting pretty hard in the summer. I mean, despite the fact that I'm going to be gone for three weeks, but outside of that, I mean, that is my time to really improve the camp. That's fine. That's easy. Anyway, we have a lot more time, so I'm excited to get some stuff. Yeah, I have a couple of things that I want to bring up. I don't know if we're at the other business yet, but uh, no, that was just this one. I, so, so for right now, we're definitely having meetings on July 25 and August 22. We're definitely dropping July 11 and August 8 is on the hit list. Yeah. So for tentatively now, it's not being scheduled. Right. Well, what did you say? Thumbs up. Thumb, yeah, thumb, yeah thumb, thumb scale of agreement. Everyone okay. agree. Up vote. Okay. Yep, okay, good. Good, great. <laughs> okay, uh, super. So where are we at now? Other business, I think. Yes. Did you have a thing? Yeah, so I just wanted to let everybody know um, we talked about the feasibility study for the rec center. I received a whole bunch of emails about this, and I had indicated to everyone that I was really interested in pursuing it, but I wanted to, for everyone who's watching um, just let everybody know that that is something that the city has decided to pursue um, and so we'll have more details in a couple weeks uh, also um, and I had an opportunity to talk to Bill about this I missed the meeting when we were talking about committee formation but the social and economic justice committee I really want to get that up and going um, I don't I'm happy to do whatever that takes but I don't know quite what that takes I think we probably need to come up with a committee structure and figure out I knew Bill and I had spoken a couple months ago at this point but yeah so if we could reset that on an agenda um, and the other thing and I had mentioned this um, several weeks ago but it's come up again in a few different contexts both in my um, in my day life and in um, the council context I think that there's a real need um, in communities everywhere, but I, I think, you know, we're really lucky to live in Montpelier where we can have really hard conversations in really meaningful ways. Um, and I really want to work with the city to plan a civic discord forum. Um, it's something I think the mayor has expressed some interest in that. Just, just having, having a space where we can learn about how to have difficult conversations about topics that people really care about, um, but doing so in a way that is productive, uh, and inclusive. So I would, I would like to explore that. And I don't know, I think we need to partner with uh, city staff on that because there are groups that do this, but there we might have resources here in the city that I'm not aware of, but um, it's something that I'd like to, to do at some point this summer. Well, as um, Janet just mentioned, Yvonne had run a diff having difficult conversations series a year or so, mm -hmm. two years ago, the city did that, so it might be just material. Sure. And I'm happy to put in whatever work we need to to, to get that up and running. But I think it's I, I think now is the time. It is it is ripe. So that maybe that's something we can like gradually sure. we can follow up on. Yeah. Um. Okay. Great. So council reports. I forget where we started last time. Uh, I think that was hers. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else to add to your council work? Here is done. <laughs> Let's go out. All right. Um, people watching from home know that our 
or can know that we had our uh, council uh, priority setting retreat over the last two nights. We uh, had a lot of great ideas were uh, were presented, and a good number of them made it onto our uh, agenda to pursue over the coming years. And I found it be found it to be inspiring and energizing and uh, but and there were some items on that made it on the agenda that, that already seemed to have very strong support and uh, we may be able to go forward on those pretty strongly but I, I think I see real opportunities on the on a lot of the items, either opportunity, because not all the things that are going to be on the agenda already have majority support. So there are opportunities to uh, build connections and build agreement of, among the council to see what we can get uh, across the line, as well as, well, I'll leave it at that. So I just want to mention that we had discussed um, having an open meeting law presentation, and I would love to do that. And I would also like to either invite or possibly mandate that our committee chairs attend that as well. Um, maybe invite would be the better thing to do. <laughs> but I, I have a feeling that a lot of them are not, in spite of the fact that we send out emails um, each year reminding them of the rules, I, I have a feeling a lot of them don't quite comprehend the full extent of the law there. So. Good call. <laughs> uh, Glenn, would you? Oh, <laughs> sorry. I, I mistook the order. Um, uh, as usual, I will be uh, ready to have breakfast with anyone who wants to show up tomorrow morning, Thursday, 8.30 to 9.30, every Thursday. Right now I'm doing it at Baguito's, uh, outside whenever weather allows. Uh, which means that I'm maybe going to get a little tanner than I have in, in decades. We'll see. Um, uh, yeah, I have been really enjoying it. Bill showed up a couple of weeks ago. We had a brief conversation. It was great. Uh, I would love to see any staff, fellow council members, neighbors from elsewhere there. Um, and speaking of neighbors, uh, this is something that I've been meaning to look up for weeks if not months but there is a Vermont neighbor day uh, June 2nd I just now remembered to look it up on Google I don't know anything about it beyond that it exists neighbor day June 2nd Saturday um, and I would like to encourage uh, everyone to have a party invite your neighbors <laughs> uh, meet them get their names and start to uh, build some connections that's uh, something that I look forward to in my neighborhood and elsewhere thank you all right, just, uh, you know, it's been three late nights. I uh, want to extend a thank you to all the city staff for sticking with us between the tours and everything else that we've been doing lately. Um, I really appreciated the work that all the staff does, does from the front line up to the top there, so thanks very much. Uh, and People Against Plastic Pollution, Pappy, uh, meeting Sunday, 6 o'clock, North Street. Uh, just give a shout for the address there, so thanks a lot. Um, I had a quest a couple items I'd like to see if there's any support for among the council. One is the Complete Streets Committee would like to have a contest of naming the bike paths, the shared paths, because we, we had a notice about the west section being completed, but no one on the Complete Streets knew what the west section was. I could explain because I knew, but the name didn't tell you. So it sounded like a really good idea. And they would like to get some signs put up on the shared paths that there is this contest going on and put it out there for a month or two and would like to know if the city council needs to weigh in on those signs, if we need your support to do it, or if we can get sort of a nod and work with DPW and see what can happen. I, sounds like a great idea. I, I support you. Uh, go for it. Okay, nod. <laughs> okay. And, also, I, I was very low in catching up with the reuse of the playground equipment. I know that there have been some emails from certain citizens got involved, but 
I don't know if you can update me on that, Bill, but I really would like to see a way for us not to lose that old equipment so we could put it in a park somewhere. Um, School says it's terrible, should go into dump, it's not safe, that's why they're changing it. They don't recommend it go anywhere. We've talked to them extensively and some of it is not easily moved, it's, it's been embedded. I'm just, I, yeah. like, I'm just yep. going by what school says. We've So what we have said to all who have asked, first the request was to move, well the request from a citizen was to move it from the playground to Harrison Field so that the kids right. could use it. And I said, you know, this is, if the school, you know, the school's going to be without a playground for a year while they're building their new ones, so if they want to do that, we'll assist in whatever we can, but really that's got to come from the school. We're not going to move their equipment for them, nor are we going to tell them that that's where they have to put their playground equipment. So we did have a meeting with school officials about other issues relating to the playground, including possible street closure ideas and these sorts of things. And so I started off and said, what's the story with the playground equipment? Do you want us to move it to Harrison Field or to anywhere? I said, the only place it should be moved is the dump. We want to get rid of it. We don't think it should be has any beneficial reuse, and we would recommend it for anybody. So from it's the city's sad. end, that was okay. okay. They approached Alex at Parks. It came up in the Parks Commission. They, the school? The, supposedly the school called Alex and I'm asked him. I'm not sure it was the school. Okay, well, he, he said he asked for one piece. That was a big slide, but okay. Uh, just Well, and maybe that, if again, if the school thinks the big slide is fine and the parks yep. are want it, we'd be happy to assist in any way, shape, or form. I, 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 I'm not doubting Alec, I just, yeah, no. there, is a, there is a person who is, presents as though they are speaking for the school and has been badgering me, and um, so I, I okay. did speak with the school and was told, no, they don't agree with this person, and no, he's not speaking for them, and no, they are not, they don't think any of this person is worth saving. Okay. You know, I trust their judgment, but um, if, if, if the parks want a piece of equipment and the school feels it's safe enough to give it to them, there's no objection to mine. Well, uh, Arnie had some interest, too, for the rec department. I think but until he talked to them about the, the condition yeah. of the equipment. Okay. All right. Well, so again, I, when I, I talked to him, just, just that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. I, and the other, the other piece was uh, we had this um, letter from the Parks Commission about dogs, and I really found this unsatisfactory, um, but maybe the rest of you don't. I mean, we at one point, we, uh, they were asked to come back with a strategy beyond this. This is what they've been doing, uh, and so I just feel dissatisfied with this. I, I would prefer to try to work with them, um, and hence I had asked for some liaison position with the Parks Commission, but I do feel we shouldn't wait for the next crisis that happens and then get upset. I'd like to work on something now that's more substantive. And one of the issues is there has been no increase in signage anywhere. And we pass these ordinance for sidewalks, shared paths, roadways, and there's no posting anywhere. There's not even a posting of no dogs around the pool area. And Arnie had stories about people's picnic lunches being snabbed by dogs. <laughs> anyway, so I would like to somehow take this up. I don't know if it's a subcommittee, but I have an interest as anyone else. I agree with you that it's, that especially on the signage, it's not been a satisfactory response. Um, I don't know that I have the capacity to, to contribute more, but I support working on it more. I know it's a, there's a contentious history. I'd be fine with that, asking them to come to a council meeting to have more of a discussion. I don't know if that is the way is the most constructive way to do it. Yeah, it sounds like there are a few different issues there, though. And one is there are ordinances now, so the signage is really just letting everyone know what our ordinances are. Then there's a bigger a different piece, mm -hmm. not a bigger piece, but a different piece. So I think part of that is something that the city can handle right. in terms of signage. Right, just the but then the other it. piece needs to needs to be figured out. The approach there needs to be figured out. So, um, 
I guess what uh, uh, thoughts over there? Uh, I mean, I guess my suggestion um, would be because no one else, I think, seems to feel like they have the capacity right now. But if um, I mean, if you are interested in talking with the that that you know, commission to see if they're willing to, I mean, they do mention in that letter, you know, the, the possibility of adding dog parks or um, some something else. I mean, well, that's one possibility is that we could flesh that out. Let's give people another option for dogs so that we're taking some pressure off Hubbard Park. I appreciated that. I thought that was I thought that was nice and um, and especially since you know Hubbard Park has a, an established culture with dogs, uh, you know, creating other spaces I think um, maybe maybe useful. Um, it's one of the things we asked them to do. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, is that the kind of thing that you're hoping that they would do more of? Like, propose a real dog park or, like, that kind of thing? This all started two years ago, right. major format. And so there hasn't been an increase in education with the canine, canine code of conduct. It just hasn't been any movement. If you read their emotions, I mean, their minutes meeting after meeting, and so I feel they need some help and support to make it happen. Yeah. Maybe they don't have the staffing to make it happen. I don't know, but well, I'd like also, to see some clear movement. They also may not have that the kind of vision or direction that you have for it. I guess I'm wondering if, you would, if you're willing to, like, uh, so, meet with them. Yeah. So I think the issue here is the council asked them mm -hmm. to look at an issue and to report back, and they reported back. Um, late, but they reported back. So, as the council, as a group, is that report except you know does that meet your needs? Is that a recommendation that you wish to accept or not? And if not, how do you want to proceed? Do you, do you as a group, want to meet with them? Is, is that send either invite them to a meeting or create a subcommittee that wants to talk to a subcommittee of them or just send someone to attend the meeting? But it seems that. <coughs> But the, the, the council ought to be speaking with a singular voice on this issue as opposed to if this is, you know, Donna's or anybody else's opinion that's that right. goes to the that's meeting, right. That's right. then right. they're going to respond to that. And, you know, the Parks Commission as a group apparently took some sort of vote because they sent a letter as a group. Uh, so this was their, this is their response to the request that was made to them. So maybe we should put it on the future agenda. And, I, I don't. I mean, I'm not trying to start. Well, if progress, everyone else is happy think, with it, then then so be it. We'll wait until. Well, we're... the signage piece. Well, the signage I, is different. Okay. I mean, I'm talking specifically. Sure. They, they were asked to sort of come back with what to do about dogs in the park and what to do about dog parks, and that's what they came. You know, signage, I agree, and I think particularly since the, the rules haven't really changed for the dogs in the park. So, other than having more signage about their canine rule of conduct. But they have changed the rules in the city, so I think we, from the city, have to be on top of that. So that's a good catch. I just hadn't thought of it. You know, when we put all new spring signs, we put the ad signs that say dogs must be on the leash. the city, so we'll bring that up tomorrow morning. But I think in terms of policy, that's really where you guys have to be. Can we add it to our list for an agenda item at a future point? I'm too fried to talk about it. Tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it it deserves a little more conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I just want to thank all of the uh, volunteers and organizers who made the corporate cup happen. Uh, it's a great event again um, this year, and uh, yeah, it's delightful. I, I guess beyond that, uh, I'm looking forward to talking further about the plastic bag ban and uh, looking into whether or not that is within our, our uh, jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Well, we're <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Instant respond. Well, I didn't want to forget. Uh, so I just had a couple things. One, um, oh, first I have the city clerk's report. Hold on. Uh, so from... Uh, Clerk says, and he has, for those who have a question, he has been watching the stream and taking the minutes. Mm -hmm. he's been, really? Yes, he has been sending me text for clarification, so he's not slacking off even though he's out of town. And I've been trying to back it up with notes. So he says, um, 
Full services in the clerk treasurer's office will re resume this Friday. Apologize again for the inconvenience. In my capacity as representative district clerk, I want to remind everyone that next Thursday, the 31st at 5 p.m., is the filing deadline to run for the state representative on the August primary ballot. Forms are available on the Secretary of State's website, and unlike municipal elections, there are three forms you need to turn in rather than two. Check with me on Friday or next week if you need any help or have questions. You can always drop me an email if you need me to get back to you soon. He also just texted me and said, tell them the camera adds 40 pounds. <gasps> Thanks, <Josh>. Oh, Josh. <laughs> Just reading what he told me to say. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for me? Yeah. So for me, um, we received a letter from uh, David Bookchin representing Jesse Jacobs about the park. Uh, I think I sent out my suggestion, and I just wanted to look around the room and see if there's a head nod, put that on the next agenda, and let Mr. Jacobs in to have a discussion about that. Are you okay with that? Yep. Yeah. Great, and I will send a letter tomorrow to him for that invitation. Um, I also want to thank, again, all of you for the time you put in the last couple of nights. It was really helpful, and all the staff really appreciated it. Uh, the consultant really enjoyed her time here with us. Um, she did say she has some time in July and August if we wanted to finish success factors, vision, and directional statements and do some stuff with the staff. I'm not pushing it, but if people want to do additional work, she did actually have some summer time. Well, I, we're going to get a report from now. her in a couple of weeks, so... Right We're actually having a staff meeting next week to start doing more fun and stuff so we can get as much of it done to you. Because then we go start doing more. So. She was great. Oh, she was great. Thank you. I'm glad I did. Yeah, yeah. Well, she was excellent. Well, you know, Everybody was. From my perspective, it also helps having books. Well, it's nice to have someone from not connected to us who could just tell us if we're all being knuckleheads to honest <laughs> words. And someone who's been in the business. Even, I mean, there's lots of good facilities, but someone who actually gets the lingo of local government. And knows what we're talking about. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> well, without <laughs> objection, we're going to adjourn. <laughs>